anything that might be still pending? Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the British Council, I am pleased to welcome you to the South Asia Leadership for Gender Equality Summit. At the dawn of a new decade, where much has changed around the world, our commitment towards an inclusive, equitable, and sustainable society remains an important priority. Although we have seen some progress on the sustainable development goals on gender equality, much more needs to be done. The pandemic has also revealed that deep inequalities and gender gaps continue to exist. It's time to reflect on these challenges and work towards a more equitable future. With this as a background, I'm pleased to introduce the Leadership for Gender Equality Summit, which is a virtual two-day mega event curated against the backdrop of International Women's Day 2021. Through keynote addresses, panel discussions, fireside chats and workshops, we aim to connect current and future leaders at the regional South Asia level, based on the diversity of their approaches, pursuit of positive social change, and commitment to the cause of gender equality. We will now start the event with the Women's Leadership Forum, which will draw insight into the experiences and ideas of South Asia's most influential leaders. We have an eminent panel of speakers consisting of Ms. Srila Tabatliwala, Senior Advisor, Knowledge Building Kriya, Dr. Sulochana Segera, Founder, Women in Management, Ms. Nigat Dhar, Executive Director, Digital Rights Foundation, and Dr. Salimul Haq, Director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development. The forum will be moderated by Ms. Vaishali Sinha, a leader in her own right. Vaishali is the Chief Sustainability, CSR, and Communications Officer at Renew Power and is also the founding chair of the Renew Foundation. She serves as an independent woman director on the board of several leading corporates. She's a member of the governing council of the UN Global Compact Network India and chairperson of their gender committee. She is also the chairperson of South Asian Women in Energy, chair of CII's Indian Women Network and Women Empowerment Committee, and a member of the governing council of the Vedika Scholars Program for Women. In 2020, she was named in She the People's 40 over 40 list of women achievers for the year. We are really fortunate that she is moderating this panel today. Before I hand over the session to her, a few housekeeping rules for all of us. The session is for 50 minutes duration and it will end at 2.50. There will be a buzzer five minutes before the session is scheduled to end. There is a Q&A section in which the audience can put their questions. And I take this opportunity to inform the audience that the session is being recorded. Without further ado, I will now invite Ms. Vaishali Sinha to please take over the session. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, and thank you for those wonderful introductions. Uh, I think that puts pressure on, on all of us to do more and to do better. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a real pleasure to meet you in the best possible way we can during these times. Let me begin by thanking the British Council for not only conceptualizing and hosting the Leadership for Gender Equality Summit, but also giving me the opportunity to be with and be in this August company. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating this session and engaging in a conversation with each of the panelists and more importantly, listening to each one of you. We all know that 2020 was a horror year, to put it mildly, 
with the global pandemic of unprecedented scale, unexpected. I don't think any of us really, you know, expected this massive disruption, misery, uh, and, 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 and the kind of impact it really had on women. That was disproportionate. In many ways, the pandemic has taught us the value of an inclusive, equitable, and resilient socioeconomic structure to fortify us against other calamities of this sort if they would occur. It's always good to see a silver lining and we are trying to do that. Uh, the new decade has dawned with fresh hope and countries are now pressing the reset button. Now, as we build back better, we can no longer afford to push gender issues and concerns to the periphery. Women must be at the heart of this global recovery. I don't think any of us would uh, disagree with that. We really have to tap the, on, full on, on. the full potential. Hello? Yeah, I can, can, I, can I request people who are not speaking to be on mute, please? Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, we really need to tap the full potential of women. I think we all agree, and it's, it's critical for us to be able to do that, to move onward and forward in, in this journey. In recent times, uh, we have seen a lot more buzz and awareness around gender equality, and the truth is that we have covered a fair bit of ground when it comes to bridging the gender divide. It's important for all of us to take stock of where we have come. Uh, that's what motivates us actually to keep you know, moving onwards more forcefully. In India, especially under the leadership of uh, our prime minister, and, um, you know, we have definitely come out with a lot of policies to empower women, um, you know, in the rural areas and even in, in the urban areas. So that's, that's, that's a shift in the right direction. Globally, we've seen the Nordic countries have set benchmarks for a lot of us to learn, study, and perhaps even emulate where possible. Um, so there's so much to learn. And I think if we look at some statistics, um, we also will agree that we have a long way to go to ensure that women have equal access and opportunities when it comes to healthcare, education, skilling, participation in the economy, leadership positions, and the list is long. And, um, but, you know, there are a few statistics that are particularly concerning when you look at women leaders. Uh, one thing which we see across is that very few women, be it the government, be it the private sector, are in few leadership roles. You know, we need many more women to be up there to make decisions, to frame policies, legislations. And, you know, that's going to accelerate the journey we all want to be on. And we have seen it. I think each one of us have seen it when women are in leadership positions. Magic does happen. Miracles happen. Things get done better. And why deprive all of us of that uh, benefit? Um, you know, what is worse is that few women at the top create a cycle, right? Uh, where we have many more women coming up there too. So it's something to ponder about. And I think we need more role models and we should all contribute as leaders towards that um, goal. Uh, let me share just some data, and I'm, I know a lot of data is going to come up in our conversations, uh, given the experts we have. Um, women are overrepresented in support functions like admin, while men tend to be leading in, you know, bottom line profit driven roles, R&D, etc., which are crucial and which eventually lead to leadership positions. You know, for example, in a company like ours, they're likely to become the CEO. In 2020, 40% of human resources directors are women compared to 17% of CMOs, 16% of chief information officers, etc. If I talk about India, and you know, that's where we look at a lot of data, India has the third lowest global representation of women managers. That's not a good statistic. It's not a statistic any of us uh, feel proud of. Uh, only 8% of management roles were held by women and only 2% of women were CEOs in India, right? Not very encouraging, though we have come a long way. Let's not forget that, but we still have a long way to travel. Um, and so when you look at entrepreneurship, which, which, you know, which is very critical in a world in which we live, uh, only 11% of seed funding as per WEF 
was uh, allocated to a woman founder. So it's a huge bias there as well. So lots of things to be fixed and lots of uh, actions to be taken. And, um, you know, we really need to focus on it as we, you know, have this conversation. More importantly, as we work independently in our respective areas um, to do more to engage women in leadership positions. With that, um, you know, what I want to do is I don't want to take any more time talking about, um, you know, you know, uh, the facts. I want to hear them from our esteemed set of panelists we have here. I will turn to our first speaker for this afternoon, Ms. Srilata Bhatliwala. Srilata, you're deeply involved with causes like gender, sexuality, and human rights, but you're also known to be a prominent face of the feminist movement in India. Um, so there are a few areas I'd like to hear uh, from you, and I promise you I'm not going to inter interrupt you for many minutes as you start speaking. So let me shoot the questions now. What does women leadership mean to you? You've written extensively about feminist leadership. How is this different from mainstream or women's leadership in general? Also, you've been closely associated with grass the grassroots movement in India, as you spoke about in the beginning. What role have women leaders played in enabling these movements. Over to you, Srilata. Okay. Um, thank you, Varshali. Uh, so I think I would start by <clears throat> responding to your first question uh, and say that I actually make a very strong distinction between women's leadership and feminist leadership. They're not the same thing at all, because uh, simply being a woman in leadership does not make you a feminist, let alone a feminist leader. Just as being the head of a social justice organization doesn't necessarily make you a socially just leader. There's a big difference and I want to make this very clear at the outset that we should not conflate these terms. We should not conflate the term uh, women's leadership with the term feminist leadership because simply occupying a female body and performing leadership in a deeply feudal, patriarchal, oppressive, domineering way, uh, what are we really achieving? We're, uh, we get lots of women's bodies physically into different structures, whether they are corporate or government or uh, you know, civil society. And the performance of leadership continues in the same old way. I don't think there is, well, of course there's a point because natural justice requires that there be equal representation of women in all structures and that there can be no dispute about and I'm certainly not questioning that. But I'm saying, what then? Because for me, the key distinction that I make and which I think is the, at the heart of the notion of feminist leadership is not what you're leading or that you are a leader it is why are you leading? What is the purpose of your leadership? And if your purpose as a feminist is to transform the world by dismantling not only structures that have oppressed women, such as patriarchy, but all the op other oppressive structures that patriarchy works in close partnership with, uh, structures of you know, class discrimination, caste discrimination, which we are still grappling with in uh, South Asia, uh, religious discrimination, discrimination against people because of their gender identity, their sexual expression, their age, their location, their language. We have thought of multiple different ways of discriminating against people and excluding them. So the purpose of leadership for a feminist has to be the transformation of these 
oppressive, discriminatory structures of power so that everyone is free, is liberated, is valued equally in society so that everyone's potential, everyone's power, everyone's capacity can be expressed. So my goal is not to achieve leadership simply to prove that I can lead or to have women gain leadership simply to say, okay, we now have 50% women say in our parliament or uh, heading our uh, corporate uh, 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 world, but it is about how are they going to use that position and that role to change things. Now this, to answer your second question, is exactly what I both worked towards and saw very vividly uh, in my grassroots work. Because the very first thing that happened when we started forming village level collectives, uh, sanghas we used to call them in Karnataka, we call them sanghas, they are called samus, they are called by many different names in uh, different parts of South Asia, was the women saying, now let us elect a president, a vice president, a secretary and a treasurer. Now, why were they saying this? Because this is the classic hierarchical leadership model they had seen all around them. That's what they saw in the village panchayat or the village council. That's what they saw in, in government. That's what they saw in uh, law enforcement machinery. That's what they saw in the workers unions. So we said, no, let's experiment with something different. Let's try having a collective leadership model. Let's have a shared leadership model. Let's have rotating leadership. And then of course, all these other challenges came up that even within a collective leadership, say three or four women playing that role for a given period of time, all those same power dynamics started getting reproduced. Uh, those who had the power were all, also the ones who were say, meeting the district collector or meeting the you know police in charge for the district or meeting the development officers and other officials for all their various needs and things that they were struggling with and they would be, they then of course had internalized that if i'm a leader then i have to act like that so for example they started withholding information from the rest of the members of the group. And no, 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 I will tell you later. You know, that's that sort of thing. Uh, so we had to be on a constant process of challenging these patterns, of asking ourselves why, which would bring me, uh, I've decided not to show my slides because of my limited time, but which brings me to what is at the very core of the concept of feminist leadership, which is about how do we share power? How do we share information? And how do we share the process of leading change? One, and two, perhaps even more importantly, that the process of transformation, of transforming the world too, you are a site of transformation because within you are embedded and internalized those same power dynamics of which you may be a victim in one relationship or which have acted on you in oppressive ways in other relationships, but you reproduce them as a way of gaining a little bit of power, a little bit of advantage or over others. So if we don't see the process of transformation as beginning from within me, from within myself, of examining my biases, my practices, my ability to practice what I'm preaching, there is no hope of changing the world if we don't become sites of change. Let me stop there.
Thank you, Sri Lata. You've made some very, very thought provoking uh, points and some corrections. And we've noted the corrections as you started, which is feminist leadership versus women leadership, right? And 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 very important for us. Versus. Okay. Different. It's not. They're different. They're different. Yeah. yeah. It's and and it's important. I see that in climate all the time. You know, we have to be able to be clear about the terms we are using and the context in which we're using these terms. So that's important. And we all have to look at the purpose of leadership, right? Not leadership for the sake of leadership. Um, and patriarchy and, uh, you, know, you know, other sort of barriers uh, need to be addre addressed. And we need to look at flatter structures versus hierarchy. So all great points and thank you for making them. Uh, I just wanted to ask one very quick and if you can respond to it quickly before I go to the next uh, person, is that in your samus which you formed, did you actually find the women empowered or did you feel that they were fronts? Because we see that a lot in areas we work in, that there are women who are you know, implementing programs, but they're not the ones who are really empower. Did you see that in, 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 in the work you do? You're on mute, uh, Sri Lata. Uh, initially, yes, but that is in fact, that was one of our main goals, um, was to help women to get in touch with the power within, what we call the power within. That power mm -hmm. is not just something that's outside us and acting on us, but we also have power within us. But because of our you know, social settings and the norms, et cetera, that power within us is often not activated or are not allowed to be expressed and utilized. Right. So the whole point of the Samu was that it became a space where they could activate that power and express it, even sometimes in the very smallest of ways, uh, writing a song about the change they wanted to see, uh, doing an exercise which was about their dream, their vision for a better society, where each and every voice counted, each and every individual's image counts. So God. initially, yes, but it was a very short-lived period and very rapidly, almost all of them became empowered. Good. Because Thanks, and I guess. Space. Excellent. Yeah, and perhaps you can spread this effect uh, in other parts of the country as well, uh, you know, uh, in different ways. I think that'll be quite useful. Um, thank you so much, Srilata, for your um, uh, comments. I will now uh, move to Ms. Sulochana uh, Segera from Sri Lanka. Dr. Segera, you have worked extensively as a mentor and advisor working with businesses to ensure they have a more gender diverse and inclusive management at the top. In your view, where do women leaders have the greatest impact? How do they make a difference to organizations? And is their leadership style different from that of men? Like just from your firsthand experience, uh, what is your observation? Um, over to you for your comments. Thank you. And Sri Lata put the platform correctly, saying leadership on the uh, feminine leadership and uh, women leadership is too different. But my concept is leadership has no gender. Empowerment also has no gender. I do not know why we, when we speak about women, we say women leadership. But when we speak about men, we don't call it men leadership program. But for women, we put women leadership program. So the thing is, uh, leadership has no gender. It's the way you approach and make decisions is the difference. It's a biological difference. And also it's a thinking and the value system difference comes when it comes to leadership uh, style. So what I've seen is just clicking a gender on a corporate, this thing that we have so many women in this board, it's not going to make a difference, right? It's what you bring to that board. What are the skills and the competencies which is bringing to the board that matters? Sometimes we just wanted to get uh, our companies with, with saying that we have two female in our board, or our corporate leadership, we have so many women. But are they really representing the what the caliber of uh, the results, right? We had to look at the end of the day, the corporates runs with the results. 
So are the results are actually uh, showing off you with that there's a dive because there was a diverse management. There was a diverse board that the results were changed. So this is what I think many corporates look at now, even though I know India has quotas and I think Bangladesh also has quotas. Sri Lanka is not yet has come to quotas because there are two minds of this because Sri Lankan, uh, the, the debate was, do we women want it to be a quota for us to be in the board or are we looking at the professionalism? Which I think for one thing I would agree is, yes, sometimes you need quotas just to ensure that they put up their mindset and understand you need it. But then again, the uh, argument come, are they really taking women to represent the company benefit or it's a, if it is someone known to you? So these things has been debated in Sri Lanka. I'll just give you the background of Sri Lankan leadership in corporate. So uh, basically a Sri Lankan economic, active economic population is just 8.4 million, right? From that, um, if you look at it, the contribution from the female participation in the economy is 35 to 36% in Sri Lanka. While our literacy is 92.6%, and our university uh, approach is 60 to 70%. Sadly, only 35, that also mainly on the uh, informal sector. So if there is a choice, many of the universities, when we do research, when we ask why you do not want to come back to work, so they, they say, this is our choice. So we have only 5% female CEOs in Sri Lanka, right? So it's not just, you know, having the percentage of so many literacy or so many professionals or so many educated. It's whether they are keen to get into that top management. Now it's changing because you, uh, in Sri Lanka now, the, it's not about board is requesting, it's women are ready to get into the boards. And the approach is they do not want it to be just the female. They are saying they are not competing with them. That's where the women should also make the mark. We should compete with our competencies, not the, uh, not with another gender. And uh, uh, what we have seen in Sri Lankan corporate leadership is females are more on to profit. They have more professional qualifications. Like we have 60% of our females in the corporate are professionals. They are 60%, right? So they have professional qualification. And uh, highest number of female uh, who are getting educated they are from lawyers to finance and to doctors. So they are still going on those traditional qualifications. But now the supply chain and all that are coming. What, um, what my concept, if we, now, uh, if we look at the global and Sri Lankan concept, uh, now the hierarchy level of this, is, it's a flat hierarchy. Most of the companies are uh, practicing. And also the, when you see a lady coming into the board, she ensure that the success are also been groomed and even though the gender is not an issue, but they will prefer a female gender because if a female, if a lady fail, that it's not only her, she's failing. She's failing that all the ladies will not be able to hold that position. That's the, you know, that's a myth which is coming back. So you, sometimes it's, a, I would say it's been very hard for a female. It's, we say it's hard to go top, but I say it's, it's hard to retain on top. Because people will support you to go to the top, to go into the board. But to, but to be in that board, to retain your leadership styles is the most difficult thing because your support system is not there. So I think the timing is uh, limited, but I'll, I'll end up saying this. At the day actually all this discussion stopped using women leadership, empowerment for women and all that, then we will be a neutral. It's about leadership. It's about empowerment. It's not about female or male leadership or empowerment of female. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silochuna. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I think you make some very good points. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on, uh, you know, the literacy rates which we see in Sri Lanka. You know, it's good to know uh, that women are doing so well. Um, you know, you made a point on uh, women two points which I thought were very interesting. One is that they don't want to go to the top management, right? They don't want to go there. You know, sometimes I think about that and I wonder why. 
Is it because they have too much on their plate already and so they find it difficult to manage? And should we think about, uh, you know, trying to perhaps uh, do something about it? When, when we talk about it, we look at, you know, for example, parenting is the biggest sort of, you know, barrier. And it's very, very sort of, it leans heavily on women and they, especially in the corporate sector, you know, I've had two kids in, you know, countries like New York and London, and it's, it's, it's very demanding. And, you know, you really need to take on a lot of burden. Uh, is that, do you think, a reason why women resist the kind of burden they have beyond work, whereas men enjoy if I could, I know we don't have to look, you know, the, this panel is not in favor of looking at men and women, but this is a fact. When we look at mentorship, you know, I see around me firsthand, men have mentorship opportunities in after hours, you know, in happy hours. Women have to get back home and take care of the homeworks, etc. And that's the reality, whatever we may say. And if we don't change that, nothing's gonna change for women. We really need women to step it up at work and for men to step it up at home a little bit and the ecosystem to make it possible for women also to enjoy the success which is waiting for them at the workplace. What are your views on mentorship? And you did say that, you know, I mean, you know, women are very good at nurturing and they should do more. But do you agree that that's perhaps a reason why women are not able to stay at the top? So while I was doing mentoring, so I have seen two segments. One is the young mentoring and one is already in the middle age. So what I've seen is it's something, uh, yes, the childcare, the parenting, they, that's they're already in the plate. When it comes to Asia, it's there, right? Even though it's system change, it's, it's inside us. It been uh, from the birth, it has told that you are being into that. So it's all almost in our subconscious. That is one of the major reasons. But I would say this, what I've seen is um, the women has made their own choice that they will rather invest the money they are spending on mentoring for themselves, for their children and family, right? So there is a um, monetary value also. Because when I have asked, you know, you are so skilled, you have that background, you have that experience, why not go to this mentoring and get into it? Then she will always put two into two and see what's the best for her and what's the best for the children and the family. Then she made the choice. So women subconsciously make choices in favor of others than herself. So this is, I have seen very much with the middle age. But if I, when I do mentoring for young people, they will ask, you know, how many years for me to there? Then they will ask, what are the skills need to be for that portion? They will go on that and they will get it. They will not wait for that five years experience, six years, seven years. The routine will be work. And she will go the other way around because for her, it's not a choice. This is what I wanted to get. Okay. But for a middle-aged person, it's a choice. Whether okay. I'll choose this or that. So two different of, because I have seen millennials are changing that they are more on to themselves, but uh, age when the middle-aged people, will, women, especially women, they will prefer it is given to the, someone young. True. So they have asked True. and said, now why? Why? I think I have done enough. So now what? So I have seen that. Very true. And I guess it's got to do with the conditioning, the way I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, girls are raised, were raised, I think it's changing now. I have a 22 year old. I see a lot. I can tell you it's changing big time. I worry about my son sometimes, uh, but, That's you know, it, 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 but it's changing and I'm so proud of the change we are seeing. So thank you for your comments. I will now turn to Miss uh, Dad. Um, you know, you're an accomplished lawyer and a human rights activist from Pakistan. It's such a pleasure to meet you and have an opportunity to chat with you. Nikat, you're known to be a digital cru a crusader. You champion causes like free access to internet, digital security for women, uh, helping women bridge the digital divide, etc. It must be challenging as in your country, as we see in a bunch of the other South Asian countries, there is a fair bit of restriction which have been imposed and imposed particularly so on women, right? Um, we all agree that, uh, you know, the world has turned virtual and so it's quite critical for all of us to have freedom in this area. 
So, um, and especially in the post pandemic world, during the pandemic as well, I mean, what would we do without technology? And I often say, what would we do without energy and clean energy as well? Because, you know, these are all continuous sources, which we've all heavily relied on during these times. Um, you know, so in this world, I wanted to, and in these times, uh, you know, how can we bridge this di uh, divide? What is it that we can do to address this issue? And um, also, what are the strategies which are required for different stakeholders to make this possible, to dismantle the barriers um, so that we can all benefit from the digital revolution? Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, so first of all, I would like to say that, uh, you know, um, when I and sh would like to share my own experience that when I started working on digital rights or technology and human rights in Pakistan, there were not uh, many women, actually no women working specifically or uh, targeting this uh, uh, topic. Uh, there were uh, technology, uh, the, the sector around technology or IT sector is very male dominated. And I, 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 I would go to say that, you know, like uh, around the globe, we say we see like a lot of men basically occupy the leadership positions when it comes to technology. Uh, and my aim was, I mean, I worked with, uh, you know, different um, um, people, um, mostly male bosses. And at the end of the day, I thought that I think we need to create a space for ourselves where women actually lead these conversations and sort of think about technology from the from feminist lens and you know this basically takes me to the conversation with ma'am ma uh, which ma'am shri lata basically said that there is a specific difference between when we say woman leadership and feminist leadership because when i started working on digital rights in pakistan i uh, actually uh, recognized myself as a feminist leader but Trust me, that's not easy to be a feminist leader because all the internalized patriarchy uh, basically, you know, push you to do things in, in masculine way. And you keep challenging yourself that, no, I have to do this thing from this particular way, uh, with empathy, with, from the justice angle, with, with the angle of equality, equity. And it's hard. It's hard when you we, when you live in a patriarchal society, and when you have seen uh, people around you uh, behaving in more, most of the time in masculine ways. It's hard to pave that way. So I would say it's a it's a struggle for feminist leaders like me, not just to pave way for yourself and set the right precedent, but also pave way for the women who are working with you and create a space for them so that they can be in the leadership position as well without taking into account the hierarchies and you know the different uh, uh, structural setups that we have seen all our lives in, uh, in our workplaces. So that's one thing and, I, and I'm still struggling. I try my best, uh, it's hard. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's a way to do it. But with, with regards to your second question around uh, digital divide, I would call it, it's like a gender digital divide. It's an emergency at the moment, especially in our countries where we talk about uh, uh, no access to internet or rare access to technology and information technology, but we hardly talk about the gender, you know, like how this uh, gap into uh, in accessing technology and internet in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, impact women and marginalized bodies. We don't even think about vulnerable and marginalized bodies, and that's not part of our conversations. Uh, during pandemic, what we have seen that the governments had more focus on making laws and regulations or regulating internet or, you know, uh, and, um, and, making IT laws and stuff, but very less focus on how to make internet accessible to the woman. And especially in Pakistan, what we saw, and, um, and probably that's the case in India and Bangladesh as well, that when people went online for e-learning, we didn't even look into our internet penetration, uh, you know, that how much we have it in our countries. In Pakistan, it was 
22% and during pandemic it went up to 35% and women went back especially those women who were studying in in cities uh, uh, in colleges universities living in hostels had to go back to their villages and towns uh, and they had no access to internet most of the towns villages have no good access to internet so that they can be online and and continue with their education men still had that privilege to go outside of their home and find the internet connection and get connected and you know do whatever they want to do but women who were not allowed to step outside of their home were not you know uh, were not able to access so i think these are the angles that we really really need to look into and this is the new world order that we are living uh, living in especially in pandemic so and the, these are the things that the governments and also civil society really need to look into uh, and think from the intersectional point of view when we talk about technology and its access to people. Great. No, thank you so much for doing what you do. And thank you for bringing attention to such an important topic. And that is uh, the future, I think. And we want we have to make sure that women are at the heart of this, because if they are not, they're not going to be a part of the fourth industrial revolution, which is staring at us, right? So thank you for doing what you do, as I said, and I know there are deep rooted issues of patriarchy, masculinity and all of that. Um, and I think that is a fight which goes uh, beyond technology. Uh, and oh, sometimes I feel it shouldn't be a fight. It should, if we do it with friendship, I think we'll be more successful. And that's what we all try to do, but it's an issue we really need to address. So thank you so much, Ms. Dad, for really kind of uh, flagging it as an emergency. Um, another area of emergency is climate change. And that brings me to um, Dr. Haak. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to have you on this panel. and. Uh, you know, when we talk about climate change, there's absolutely no doubt that women are at the heart of it in not a positive way as we would like it, but in a rather negative way. So how can we get more women at the heart of policy making and ensure that, you know, they get less impacted negatively and benefited more positively as we sort of advance in this whole climate change energy transition um, zone? Thank you very much, uh, Vaishala, and thank you for inviting me uh, to be here. It's a privilege uh, to be the only male on this panel, but I am uh, absolutely one of you feminists as well. Uh, so I'm a, f a male feminist, as uh, you said, it hasn't, uh, doesn't have to be only women. Um, what I uh, will try and do is to share with you uh, some of the experience uh, that uh, has happened in my country, Bangladesh, as you know, uh, I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University, Bangladesh. And we in Bangladesh are now currently observing our 50th anniversary as an independent country. And so a lot of celebrations going on uh, for that change. And just a few days ago, uh, um, a very eminent columnist in the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof, uh, wrote a, a column in the New York Times uh, aimed at President Biden, uh, advising President Biden on how to tackle poverty in the United States. And his message was, learn from Bangladesh. In the last 50 years, Bangladesh has actually demonstrated a very significant uh, improvement in development, in poverty alleviation, and in uh, women and gender issues. Still a long way to go. We are, we are not perfect, but I am a glass half full rather than half empty person. And the, the question then is how do we fill it even more uh, and keep filling it more in terms of what to do next? And Nicholas Kristof's analysis uh, of what made the difference in Bangladesh was two things. And in my view, they're the same thing. He says education and focus on girls. And I would say education of girls was what changed and made the difference in Bangladesh. And the other key component of that is uh, not just uh, the numbers. I, numbers are important. I don't want to uh, uh, disqualify having uh, you know, uh, sufficient numbers of women in the different uh, um, arenas in education, as well as in the workplace, as well as in senior positions. But at the same time, it's an attitude change of the men. And that to me is a key element. You know, if we don't change men, then uh, it remains to a large extent tokenism. 
uh, as a number of our previous panelists have already said. Uh, how do we make it go beyond tokenism? And, I, and speaking as a man, uh, you know, in Bangladesh, we're a Muslim cult, uh, country. Um, culturally, we are also patriarchal. Uh, we have all these, uh, um, you know, remnants of culture that have uh, uh, suppressed women's uh, emancipation and education and uh, uh, moving in the workforce. But nevertheless, we have been able to overcome to a very large extent. Uh, and I'm very, very hopeful to come to your uh, question about the context of climate change, which is a brand new problem that has now emerged. And particularly for us in the region, South Asia, it's going to be a big problem for Bangladesh in particular. It is already a very big problem. And as you've, uh, you've quite rightly pointed out, the victims are largely uh, women. Uh, they, there's a disproportionate number of uh, women victims in, in the most vulnerable groups. Uh, and so we need to be taking that into account. But I, I'm very, uh, myself, uh, um, positive and optimistic that based on what we have been able to do already in terms of educating and empowering women in our country over the last generation, the next generation, we will also be able to do the same. And I think, you know, one of the big differences in the way we need to approach this is on leadership. I think we need to now focus on uh, gender sensitive leaders, you know, be they men or women. It, it is not counting the number of women. It's, uh, it's the, uh, the way in which the leadership is uh, um, uh, exhibited. It's supporting uh, equal opportunities for men and women going forward from young girls in schools all the way to uh, women in the workplace and, and working at home and, and giving them a due respect, even if they're just uh, staying at home and not in the formal workplace. And so that to me is a really big uh, challenge, a cultural shift, educational shift, making uh, boys and men equally feminist and uh, recognizing that they have a big role to play and that they have a big responsibility to uh, uh, take this issue as seriously as women and not to put it into the box of just helping women uh, uh, empower themselves. That, that I'm not against that, but I'm saying we should not confine ourselves to that and we need to be breaking out of that. So the final point I'll make in the context of how do we tackle climate change? In my view, we will tackle climate change with investing in educating our young girls uh, uh, of today. The young girls, of the, their mothers got educated uh, in the last generation and have shown uh, that they can contribute very substantially to the country, both economically as well as, as culturally and socially. The next generation has the opportunity to do that as well, but a different yeah. kind of education. And I like Nigat's uh, uh, attitude. You know, we, we're in a different world now. Even in a COVID-19, we are in a Zoom world. We're talking to each other. This is, this is where young people can really make a big difference. They don't, doesn't matter where you're located in, in Dhaka or in Delhi or in Islamabad. You can become a global person. You can engage in, in global, uh, you know, IT and other kinds of information and sharing. And young people have the ability to do that. The world is you know, their oyster. And we need to be giving them the support and education that enables them to do that. Unfortunately, the kind of education we're giving them is really the wrong kind. We're giving them, you know, pass exams, get a job type of uh, uh, education, right. which is really not fit for purpose anymore, either boys or girls. But if we can change our system of education and empower them to be problem solvers, to be inquisitive, to be innovators, to take the initiative themselves, and then as a society, support them for taking those initiatives, even if sure. some fail and some succeed, it doesn't matter. Making them take risks, being innovators to me is the way forward. And I, I, I do believe that in this region in South Asia, we have the wherewithal within a generation. This is not going to happen overnight. We're talking 10 years uh, or 15 years from now. But if we start the investment now, then I think we will get the dividends and it'll be a huge dividend within a matter of a decade if we can invest in our young people, both sure. boys and girls, but with an emphasis on girls. I'll stop there for now. Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Hak. And I've heard stories in Bangladesh, how uh, you know supporting the girls in schools 
really got uh, the, the, the boys, uh, you know, left behind. And that's something for us to learn. Not that we want to do that, but we need to do that a little bit just to make sure that from a positive point of view, we are encouraging women. We are showing the confidence uh, in them as we must. Because I think, you know, in India also we see, and I hope, uh, uh, you know, some of you would agree uh, that, you um, you know, girls definitely are outstanding when it comes to the 10th and 12th grade, um, you know, results, the merit listers dominated by girls. But when you look at the confidence with which they step out in the world, they're not as confident and we need the confidence to succeed and solve the problems. And um, and I think uh, they, f they fear failing because they feel that if they fail, whatever little they have is also not going to be theirs. So really great points you've made, super learnings. And I browse, I know I'm cognizant of the time we have, we don't have much time left. So what I'm going to do is I browse through the questions, but uh, Deepa, you may come in. Uh, what One question which I'll open to anybody on the panel is that you know we have uh, real experts and accomplished uh, panelists from South Asia. What is it that we can do together to make sure we can have a shared learning and we can share our learnings from one part of one country to another so that you know uh, we, we can hope to have a better South Asia especially when it pertains to, you know, women and the role they can play. So uh, I know we have, uh, Deepa, please come in and tell me, I think we have one minute to wrap up the session or is there some flexibility around that? That's that's right, uh, Vaishali, one okay. minute to go and okay. the next panel is all prepped and ready. Okay, got it. So any one person can take this very quickly. Sorry about that. And we can, we can take your comments and circulate it later on. Um, yes, Sri Lata, please go ahead feel ready to jump in on this because I Please really do. strongly about it. So thank you so much for giving us that as the final question. I think really one very concrete thing that we need to do that we haven't done, at least not very effectively, is we need to create a shared resource pool of the stories of change, documenting the different obstacles and barriers that women face, that people of other gender identities face, uh, documenting uh, stories of innovative leadership practices, but we need it as a shared resource, you know? Yeah, sure. So we can begin to analyze and develop strategies with a much larger knowledge true, base. True, and that's a great point. And I think with technology, uh, as Nikat pointed out, I sh I'm sure we can do it. It's not like I lead South Asian Women in Energy Forum and we are doing that for energy. We can do it broadly speaking for gender as well. And so we can perhaps work uh, on that later today. I know it's 2.50, I want to be on time. I just want to leave all of us with the thoughts and especially the audience, those in the audience, you know, we owe it to ourselves to ask for what we want. And we should be prepared to go and get it, not only get it, grab it. That's when we move ahead in the right direction. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for doing what you do. You're extremely inspiring. I've been inspired so much by your comments. Thank you for joining this panel. And thank you to the council for hosting this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vaishali, and uh, thank you to all the panelists, uh, uh, you know, for uh, for your insightful comments on the on the topic. Uh, I wish we'd had more time, uh, but I think all for all forums, we feel that we should have had more time and you know to discuss this further. Uh, but a heartfelt thanks for on behalf of the British Council to everybody and Vaishali for expertly steering this conversation and bringing in so many so many interesting comments. We had about uh, 720 people who have tuned in uh, to listen to this forum. So, you know, I think that was, that's testimony to how, um, you know, profound and, uh, and really insightful your feedback has been. So um, now we're going to move to the next session. And uh, um, thank it's, you. Uh, um, I think we'll thank you so much. Out. Yeah, bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the next session is the first fireside chat of the summit, uh, and it's titled The Pandemic's Differential Impact on Gender Equality, Insight into Socioeconomic Realities in South Asia. For most of 2020, the world has grappled with the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human life, society, and economy. The crisis has upended decades of progress with combined health and economic shocks taking a toll 
on the lives and livelihoods of millions of people, disrupting business activities and exposing existing fault lines in social, economic and health systems. The pandemic has forced us to face problems we have ignored for too long and the existing inequities, fragilities and unsustainable practices in intensified its impact. So the poor and vulnerable have been the worst hit and the pandemic is threatening to push millions more into poverty. This fireside, this fireside chat will attempt to give us a bit more insight into what these challenges have been through the experiences of our speakers, Dr. Rashid Bajwa and Ms. Kalki Subramaniam, who are very well placed to share these insights. A very quick introduction to the speakers. Dr. Bajwa is the CEO of Pakistan's National Rural Support Program and oversees the largest rural development operations in the country. He is an expert on financial inclusions and has held many, many high positions as the chairman of Pakistan Microfinance Network, the member of State Bank of Pakistan's Committee on Rural Finance and member of the General Body of Pakistan po Poverty Alleviation, Alleviation Fund and the Sindh Rural Support Program. Our second speaker, Kalki Subramaniam, is an Indian transgender activist, artist, poet, actor, and inspirational, inspirational speaker. She is the founder of Sahodri Foundation, an organization which works for the social, political, and economic empowerment of transgender people in India. She has received several awards for her contribution towards transgender rights. She has initiated the Trans Heart Project with a mission to reach out to 10,000 transgender people to encourage and train them to paint their untold stories on canvas. Kalki was also conferred the International Ambassador of Trans Amsterdam Organization. To moderate this session, we have Dr. Devan Chakraborty, Director of British Council East and Northeast India. In his 16 years stint with the British Council, he has led many programs on education, development, cultural collaboration, communications and advocacy programs in India, South Asia and internationally. He is one of the trustees of the International Language and Development Conference and sits on the advisory on the research advisory boards of the University of Reading. His, view, he, his views on a range of proximate disciplines in the arts and on issues in contemporary culture and education are sought by media houses in India and, and abroad. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very pleased to <laughs> hand over to Dr. Devanjan. Over, you, over to you, Devanjan. Hi, um, am I audible? Can I just have a quick check of that? Um, thank you very much, Deepa, uh, for this session and a big thanks to um, you and to colleagues in CSR Box for organizing this summit and this particular fireside chat. Um, we, I think one of the things, uh, a very interesting saying that went around the world was a one uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, was a wonderful illustration which went with the saying that we are all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. And I think the question of um, the impact of the pen pandemic on uh, the differential impact uh, on uh, gender and uh, particularly on women and um, non-binary and transgender friends and colleagues is something that we need to um, sort of discuss in, in, in detail. Uh, from a very personal, uh, 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 on a, from personal observations, I think I've seen at home, I mean, uh, uh, my wife is a senior academic, we have a 15 year old daughter, and um, all three of us are working, studying from home, but uh, I think uh, I've seen from close quarters how much more um, involved and, and complicated and difficult it has been for my wife to uh, deal with the with the pandemic, and I, we have heard very, uh, stories from across our British Council network uh, from colleagues about how much more difficult it is in multi generational households, for instance, uh, for single colleagues, particularly women, uh, and uh, colleagues with very different kind of uh, identities. We've heard uh, reports from Bangladesh that access to healthcare uh, was particularly difficult at the beginning of the pandemic for. Um, transgender and uh, non-binary uh, friends and colleagues. So uh, I think with uh, those uh, uh, opening remarks, I'd really like to invite uh, Dr. Bajwa to give us his insights into how uh, the pandemic has impacted us very differently uh, across uh, gender and identity lines. Over Thank you, you, Doctor. Um, and. Uh, a big thanks to the British Council for arranging this uh, very important uh, 
discussion and a dialogue uh, i will start by acknowledging myself that uh, during this pandemic uh, as dr devanan is saying you know before the pandemic men who work and who have housewives they do not even realize the amount of work women do at home and you know there are weekends but then weekends are not the re real normal ways uh, in which days in which women work i mean they have separate systems for weekends when the husband is here but on a weekday you i am amazed at my wife at how busy she is right from the morning till the evening and it has actually led to my understanding more about the kind of labor which housewives put uh, in and their contribution but this is just a start of it uh, i'll 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 start with a screen sharing i have a, a powerpoint uh, and i will quickly go to it uh, i hope everybody is able to see that so we're talking about yes, the so pandemic and the differential impact uh, on gender equality and uh, we have seen that uh, economic downturns uh, downturns have always affected women more than men so we, this is something which we all understand and these uh, we call them gendered impact linger long after the economy recovers and this is again being experienced uh, during this covid-19 but perhaps far more acutely and perhaps this is because uh, women dominate in works and industries that are that are susceptible to such cycles uh, i'm particularly very keen to know about microfinance and the micro and small medium enterprises and the enterprise development where there was a huge number of women who were working contribute in these sectors and uh, of course uh, these sectors uh, in particularly when you look at microfinance they're mostly related to a work in uh, retail businesses and in health related even education and then of course textile and garment and tourism and others uh, i i went through this very interesting slide this was made by ifc that uh, these are the three key areas where uh, impact have happened on the financial sector and the and the enterprises uh, one is the policy level the financial sectors and then the enterprises themselves and then we've seen that there has been a direct impact on the enterprises particularly women based enterprises so one of the things is that the credits have dried down uh, we have seen uh, com governments coming in and providing some help but that help has been marginal uh, there are now financial institutions like the banks they have reduced their time that is also adding to the woes and then of course uh, sectors like tourism and uh, other areas have actually affected in terms of uh, financial sector we know that for sure uh, that uh, that although the commercial banks have given some sme loans but and there is been a moratorium on debt repayments it happened in my country as well but that has actually added to a double burden because now when this moratorium is over now the institution are coming back and asking for money uh, from clients mostly women who have lost their businesses so what so they are now in a double jeopardy and it has created a, a new wave of impact a negative impact on their social lives as well so here they were they were trying to go out and uh, make a better living for themselves and for their families and now they have come, come back into double jeopardized situation we have seen this happening uh, in uh, in the micro and small medium enterprises also there has been disruptions uh, both in the supply chain as well as in demand so 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 agriculture businesses manufacturing textiles there have been huge disruptions but added to the problem is that there is very little demand on retail tourism housing and logistics and retail for example small shops small uh, you know vendors 
mostly women, they are suffering more than, of course, the men. So, so now, when you look at uh, the gender gaps, we, we see that uh, uh, although there was already a gender gap in, in, in the band, which we call the extremely poor people, and these are the numbers uh, which show that for every 100 men, how many poor women are there? And uh, we see that uh, that trend will perhaps increase. And, uh, and women in South Asia are expected to be even more adversely affected. Uh, and then there will be 129 women as against 100 men uh, within like the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And it shows that the women's risk of falling into poverty is obviously greater when they are, and they're more likely to have, uh, particularly when they have young children at home to care for. And the risk remains even more uh, additional and at the later adulthood stages. Uh, I'm, I'll refer back to the discussion in the earlier panel that uh, how women are adversely being affected. And uh, I'll at the end also give some re policy recommendation based on that. So basically, uh, the, this lockdown has also added gender-based domestic violence, honor killing, and uh, uh, and it has also not only just in Pakistan but worldwide uh, this immobility and a decline in economic activity has led to depression, aggression, and violent behaviors from the men towards the women. Pakistan, like other countries, have closed their schools. This is the third wave of the pandemic, and the schools remain again. Many parts of the country have been locked down. Perhaps more are going to be locked down pretty soon. So the bear, and then there are of course the barriers to accessing online classes, particularly in rural areas and in poor communities uh, where there is no electricity. What what to talk about internet connectivity? And then reports are also indicating that uh, this financial vulnerability has led parents to pull the children out of schools. And guess who are the first group? Obviously, the daughters, which have been pulling out of the school, and uh, the domestic burdens on women has, uh, have also increased because now the family members are now restricted. Earlier on, obviously, everybody would go out and the women would have time to clean and do her chores. But here we are that now the family continues to stay there. And that has also opened up a lot of issues. Um, in my country, 70% of women are in the informal sector, mostly housewives uh, and the ones who have been working, they've lost jobs during the pandemic and many women in rural areas have, have lost significance uh, in income, as I explained, due to inability to sell the, the products. So I explained this, uh, this chart of IFC. And OECD is stating that in Pakistan, it is uh, also the case that poor single and widowed women face additional difficulties in gaining access to social safety net program. We do have a big social safety net program called EXAS. We are giving about 2,000 rupees, which comes to about uh, uh, 20, around about $20 per month as a stipend to women. And there was a cash emergency cash grant also given to uh, a cohort of like uh, maybe 20% of the poorest uh, women uh, families in the country. Did, that did help, but to what extent it has helped is, is an issue because the problem is that it is easy to give a cash grant. It is more difficult to start a closed business. And that is the problem which we are facing at the moment, these micro enterprises that has been closed. And not only have they been closed, they are being pushed by the lenders to pay back. So, so that is the double, double jeopardy I was talking about. The human rights campaign uh, has released a research uh, showing how the lives and livelihoods of the LGBTQ community are particularly at risk. And their findings are their, their jobs have absolutely been decimated. And obviously, they are less likely to have any new health cover. 
and they're more likely to have chronic diseases as a result. Um, and in the general population, uh, as we compare the LGBTQ community, obviously they have, uh, they're, they're getting much worse than the general population, although the general population is not uh, that, uh, you know, they're also being affected. Uh, but they're more likely to feel that their personal finances are currently worse. So, and they are, uh, their spending, of course, has become less. Um, and uh, uh, and they are, of, co of course, uh, but they are also proactive in responding to the pandemic. I mean, we've seen these, these groups which are going on and giving uh, this kind of uh, awareness campaigns to people that, you know, well, the same things, washing of hand, putting in, um, masks and others. And uh, they are more likely to trust public health and medical authorities uh, like the doctor, WHO, and the NIH. So they are more forthcoming. This is very interesting that they are forthcoming in this pandemic. Uh, um, then, what is the way forward? I mean, the one thing which you need is that uh, the, dis the, the gender disaggregated data for women and other social groups uh, for targeting, targeting intervention and policy needs to be there. Um, healthcare facilities have to be geared up and uh, particularly these masks and protective gears. And then of course, uh, protect protection and shelter services for victims of uh, domestic abuse. Uh, because the abuse has increased, but there is no way, way to go. And that's another very difficult situation. And then of course, providing uh, financial and technical support to enterprise owned by women, as I was explaining. And then of course, the sexual and reproductive health services. Uh, uh, ensuring water and sanitation facilities to be include, including women leaders in policy making providing hygiene kits, uh, establishing food banks, and uh, women and uh, receive uh, assistance at their doorsteps uh, instead of their public places. Most of the time now they're making digital payments and uh, to women who are uh, unfortunately uneducated. So there is this mismatch as was being explained earlier on as well. Now, at the public policy level, these are the few things which I think are very critical to know one is, of course, that uh, that there has to be women, that pro-women policies must be embedded. So we should talk about pro-women policies rather than gender neutral policies. This is the change which I think is very important and it needs to be presented. And the goal should be gender equity and not just equality. And these are the two examples that, uh, you, you know, changing hiring practices instead of hiring women. It's not just enough to hire women. It's also important that we do the proper practices of how hiring is done. And like, for example, generally we say that 30% of women in work play in, a, in an organization. Um, and when, even if there is this number, we still need to show how many males are there and how much do they dominate and, and how men favor and men as compared to women. And then in COVID, particularly women were and are disproportionately burdened. I've explained to you my own experience, work from home, including taking care of children and education, mobility has been further compromised in an environment where there was already very little mobility and uh, businesses affected, especially at the micro level and has put an additional burden of women to pay back. And then how to remotely help women as we still are in a wave, the third wave within the current confines. Yeah. Lastly, I think, sorry to just, uh, just, one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. one more sentence. The discussion Thank needs you. to also look at how women, the, the only way out is when women participate in at the political level to me. And, and the only way out is having separate women electorates for women. If there is a parliament of 100 members, there should be there's actually a parliament of 200 members, 100 for women and 100 for men. 
that is how this world is going to be changed thank you very much and i will be happy to ask this question this last comment was just mine just to add on thank you sir thank, thank you, you very, very much for that uh, uh, wonderful overview of uh, of the situation from your perspective especially the economic impact i think um, the point you made about the economic uh, downturn and the impact is that had both uh, the double jeopardy you mentioned about uh, and the impact on women entrepreneurs is uh, it really strikes uh, me as significant i think the impact on the informal sector of work i think has something that has come up across south asia uh, very strongly and i think one of the things that really struck me very hard personally was uh, and this this is a point that I, i hadn't thought of before is the as an impact of the economic downturn girls are being pulled out of uh, uh, um, education systems and that is really heartbreaking uh, and as well as for societal progress i think uh, uh, we will uh, come back to, i think uh, our viewers um, have lots of questions on 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 that but before that may i invite kalki subramaniam to share her thoughts on how the uh, pandemic has impacted the uh, um, uh, transgender and non binary community welcome kalki uh, to this uh, program it's a, it's a great pleasure having you with us you are on mute thank you thank you <laughs> thank you so much sir uh for uh, for introducing and uh, asking me to speak i think uh, coming from the transgender community in india and being an activist and working with the community for the for uh, more than uh, 15 years now the lockdown the pandemic uh, has been a really a very very big uh, shocker as well as uh, uh, a fact a factor of uh, economic collapse for the community um if you look at uh, the transgender community in asia particularly whether it's india pakistan or bangladesh uh, sri lanka in countries like uh, these the transgender community is um, mostly living in poverty most of them are uh, because of the social uh, uh because of the social discrimination and stigma that prevails in all the countries and also in in our country because of that many transgender people were homeless have already been homeless many of them um, have been pushed away from uh, our families uh, due to you know the narrow gender uh, binary system and the patriarchy that we already have Uh, has pushed us out of our homes out of our family and uh, because of that factor alone we were not able to the community has not been able to continue their education at school so majority of the community people more than 70% of them but we don't have statistics there are no proper statistics but what i'm saying is from my own experiences that more than 70% of the transgender community are school dropouts and because of being a school dropouts uh, they are not eligible to go for white collar jobs and that doesn't mean they are uh, they can actually go for blue collar jobs even then that's very difficult because the community the discrimination that prevails the narrow mindedness in our society across asia and of course many uh, in many countries around the world because of the narrow mindedness that uh, exists and because of the patriarchy that exists on gender identities and gender equality and uh, transgender people and gender non binary people it has affected our transgender community at a very very uh, at all levels i would say on a so on an uh, but mostly the, uh, the drastic affected areas were definitely economic uh, areas um how would they actually uh live was a big question how would they live everyday life because for most people uh they were all uh, earning every day it's it's like a coolie they just go many of them were sex workers many of them were uh begging and collecting money and all that so when the lockdown happened the transport system stopped and because of that they couldn't go to the trains and 
um, they couldn't go to shops and that was done. And uh, because of that fact uh, also, because of the lockdown and the pandemic, uh, sex work, going for sex work also stopped. Uh, social distance was mandatory. And uh, the lockdown, the pandemic affected the transgender community so drastically that they were totally immobile and muted, voiceless. And fortunately, what actually the government uh, did try to help, but they could intervene in only certain areas, like uh, um, in the health and during uh, giving some compensations as uh, money, currency compensations and all that only could happen. Otherwise, um, any alternative jobs or anything during the pandemic was impossible impossible and uh, and the responsibility became more for uh, uh, organizations that work uh, for the transgender community and uh, what we did is uh, at Sahodari Foundation what we did it we what we did is uh, since we already have been working on uh, art and craft projects especially many transgender people were already working at home and uh, creating paintings and artwork. And this usually we do at a stretch of one to two months and then we actually go and uh, exhibit it in universities, colleges, galleries and spaces, public spaces and all that. And through the sales of these, we usually uh, raise money and that is 100% uh, given to the community. They also sell paintings through our platforms. So one of the things that actually kept the community engaged, uh, not everybody, but only those who were interested in art and craft and who were talented in that, only they were actually a little bit surviving. Uh, this is our story. This is not actually the entire transgender community story. The entire transgender community story is even worse. But because we, we're a little fortunate because of our creative skills. Uh, our community people were sitting at home and engaged in making art and craft. And uh, we had hope, we had lots of time. We had our colors and paper and canvas and everything and we started making art. So uh, one of the issues during lockdown for the community is also the mental health. Many of the community people were, as uh, because of not able to travel, not able to meet other persons, uh, it affected them so much. Already, loneliness is a terrifying um, psychological thing for uh, people like us, the transgender people who have been living alone, uh, who feel insecure because of uh, uh, not belonging to a family and. Uh, the lockdown put us even more lonelier, even more aloof, even more locked in our homes and we couldn't travel. And as I said, only uh, making up art actually helped us. So the community began to make art and I do have some presentation on that, which I would like to share. <clears throat> yep. Uh, Kalki, would you like me to present? Yes, I have some technical problems here. All right, all right. Thank you for that. No problem. I hope I'm on the right uh, slide. Yes, 
Yes, great. Great. Let me know when to go next. Yeah. So art as a way of life for transgender persons during COVID-19. It's, it's actually the presentation is only a few slides to basically give an idea about how we survive. This is our community, transgender community story in India and that to a group of us, how we survived. And uh, the next slide, please. So art helped us, the transgender community, keep our spirits up. We did so much of writing and art making during the lockdown on our personal lives and our hopes for the future. Especially, it was also a time for us to look back at our lives and deal with our insecurities, especially most, many of the transgender people are victims of sexual abuse. So because of that, um, there is always that fear and rejection and uh, all those feelings. So the lockdown helped us to sit and prod about how to deal with this and how to move forward without carrying the remains of the past and all that. So one of the projects that we do is the Red Wall Project through which we have been talking to transgender persons, documenting their lives, especially uh, the sexual, physical abuse that happened to them because of uh, uh, the discrimination that they faced and at families or at public spaces because of their gender identity. So trans people were speaking, writing about it, and it, it, it in a way helped uh, open up their hearts and open up their uh, uh, lives to another person and uh, uh, who can understand better. So we documented more than 200 transgender persons' lives uh, during this pandemic. Yeah, the next slide. Uh, for example, this, uh, this uh, trans women, transgender artist, Kala learned, uh, she has already learned during the workshops at Sahodri Foundation. And um, she engaged herself in making art for the purpose of uh, post COVID. So we all hope that the lockdown will end, but of course it never ends. It seems to never end. But uh, fortunately, at least a few things have opened. For example, we were able to exhibit at galleries and other spaces eventually. Last month, we actually uh, held an exhibition. The next slide. So, <clears throat> Art actually helped us uh, not only in keeping us alive and engaged, but next slide. We actually made, uh, we actually did exhibit our art recently last month at the Bangalore International Center. Whatever we have done during the pandemic, uh, we did an exhibition of the artworks uh, and we titled it, We Are Not the Others. The next so sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think there are lots of questions that are coming up. If we could wrap up uh, um, in a short time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two minutes, I'll finish. Thanks. So this is one of the exhibition images, this and the next. Yeah, these two are some of the images in the gallery. And the next slide. So this is me. I actually did a lot of Frida Kahlo's. And um, this is how I actually raised money for my financial uh, stability as well. The next slide. And one of the things that the community also did is that keeping us beautiful, keeping us dressing up well, um, with, keeping up with the makeup and hygienic and everything, not actually being depressed. Yet. That also helped us uh, to keep sane. Yeah, the next slide. And that is the end of the slide, yes. So I would like to move to the questions now. Thank you so much, Kalki. I think that was really very um, uh, touching. Uh, what really came through quite powerfully for me was the uh, general lack of data. And you made a very powerful point about, you know, the limited government intervention. And this is something that probably, you know, bridges our two speakers together. Uh, I was just wondering that whether it's related to lack of data and access and the invisibility and, and, the, and being uh, on mute, as you very powerfully put it. 
Um, I was uh, wondering if, if those are the factors at play. We have a number of questions that have come in. I think I'll, I'll go to uh, uh, Dr. Bajwa first. I think there's a, there's a question, Dr. Bajwa, uh, for you um, in terms of uh, uh, sharing uh, some uh, success stories and data um, uh, from uh, your perspective. Uh, and uh, Kalki, there is a question that I think is uh, uh, of relevance to you about how do we make the society uh, at large a lot more sensitive to transgender and LGBTQ community. Uh, I'll take more questions, but I think I'll leave uh, these questions um, to you to answer first as I look at other questions. Okay. Um, Dr. Bajwa, yes. Shall I go first? Or? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, so uh, the question um, that you ask is how do um, we, uh, could you come up with the questions? How do we educate? Uh, yeah, how do you make okay. the society more sensitive to uh, um, okay. the transgender non-binary? Okay, community? one of the ways actually we should make uh, the society more sensitive not only to transgender individuals, but also to LGBTQI people is that um, we need to change our education system at school, at college, at university level as well. We don't talk about LGBT rights um, in many of the countries in India and especially not in many universities. Of course, in India right now, a few universities and colleges do talk about, uh, uh, do have curriculum on LGBT subaltern literature and uh, LGBT rights and transgender lives, transgender literature and all that. But that I think isn't enough. Uh, we have such a uh, narrowness on education, especially on gender equality. And we need to understand that, and we need to make our children and people understand that gender equality is not about women being equal to men. It's also transgender people being equal to everyone whether men or women, transgender and non-binary people should be treated with respect and should be allowed to exercise our human rights, civil rights, legal rights, social and economic rights as well. So I think it begins at home. Uh, the education begins at home. The sensitivity begins at uh, the schools and colleges as well. And media is especially one of the uh, top people we should be uh, sensitizing. Thank you, Kalki. I think that's a very important insight. Dr. Bajwa, if I may uh, move to you for the question on sharing some of the success stories. There's also a related question around, um, you know, how has the stimulus package uh, that you mentioned worked? So the success stories, of course, were before the pandemic, and there were many, uh, many uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, very good uh, uh, incidences where uh, women-led enterprises have really flourished. Um, in the post-pandemic and during this third phase, I think the most important learning which we have found is that these enterprises, which have actually stopped and they have actually been consumed, so, the, so, so whatever equity was there has been consumed, uh, they still, the women are still there. The entrepreneurial spirit is still there, and the 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 will to work again is still there, and and the experience is there. So, what is lacking? The lacking is that the one thing which is lacking is equity injection into these enterprises which have stopped working. Uh, we have developed a product here in my country, and I'm very proud to say that IFA, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, they're also putting in. So what we were trying to do is give a grant equity, which means an injection of a small amount of money as a grant, but it goes as an equity, which means that they cannot, uh, not, they cannot consume this money. They can only use it to start up this business which has been affected. Uh, the stimulus package has helped in a very different way. The stimulus package actually helped in smoothening the whole issue of food security in the country. Because what happened was that as soon as immediately when incomes were dropped, 
uh, people needed money to buy food. So that gap was fulfilled by that. And as a result of that, we don't see any, uh, any impacts in terms of loss of lives uh, because of this whole thing, uh, loss of uh, food for the children as well. So people were barely making, uh, you know, two ends meet. This stimulus package continues now in the form of this uh, 2,000 rupees uh, per month uh, grant. And it goes to almost 30% of the entire population now. We call it the SAS program or the Benazir Income Support Program. And that is a flagship social so safety net program which goes on. But one has to distinguish between a social safety net program versus an enterprise program. And the enterprise program is the one which is going, which is going to sustain even the earlier one. And in order to, to, to jumpstart the enterprise program, the food for thought for perhaps most South Asian countries is look at these enterprises, see what has happened to them and try to inject some equity into it. If it is a grant, that is the best. Even if it is not a grant, it can be a tier two injection or it can also be uh, uh, equity participation. But think about equity. This is not the time to think about loans anymore. And right. this is the change which I see must bring be, be brought into the mind of the policymakers and the organizations which are, you know, which are in the business of enterprise development. Thank you, Dr. Bajwan. I would like you to urge to think, uh, if I have the time to come back to you, about the question on data that Kalki raised, uh, uh, data of marginalized communities. But I do want to come to Kalki now. Uh, Kalki, there's been a, a couple of very interesting questions, and I'm trying to merge the two. Uh, okay. uh, uh, someone has asked, um, uh, one of our viewers have asked, whether uh, the, the transgender and LGBTQ community uh, have thought of art as a profession and not just as a passion as a means for livelihood. And a related slightly tougher question has been around uh, whether um, the, the transgender community uh, is, is not enough visible in the semi-skilled labor market. Would you uh, like to take these two questions together? Yes. Art as profession and not just passion and semi-skilled labor market participation by the LGBTQ community. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... Art as a profession is definitely a possibility and already we are seeing success. Um, for transgender people who were affected because of the pandemic and were, uh, they, uh, who were actually uh, economically affected, for them definitely art helped. And that is also one of the uh, times that they understood the, the realization of creativity and the practice of art and how it can actually save the community. So many transgender people, I'm not saying all of them, but many of them actually continue the practice of art and uh, whether it's acrylic or abstract or oil painting or watercolors, the creative spirit of the community was out during the pandemic and uh, especially the landscape that they did out of their own uh, imaginations were actually very good and they sold at uh, during our exhibition. Yes, art as a profession is definitely a possibility and it is possible. Not only art, but of course, uh, transgender people need to be given opportunities in, uh, in at all levels, especially in the area of arts, whether it's singing, dancing, acting, um, films or anything. The second Thank question. Yeah. Thank you, Kalki. Okay, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I think it's it's fantastic to have you and Dr. Bajwa with us. And Kalki, you actually live the example, uh, what, what you were speaking about. I think you, you live that as, as an artist, uh, uh, as a very well-known artist and, and a range of uh, um, things that you do. So thank you, Dr. Bajwa. Thank you, Kalki, for uh, being with us. Uh, we have run out of time, but uh, it's it's been an absolutely inspirational discussion um, uh, to host, and I've really learned a, 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 a great deal from this conversation. So thank you, and all the very best. May you all stay safe. I think across South Asia we are witnessing uh, another surge. So I think um, uh, um, I think health and safety is is uppermost in our minds. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much, and anybody.
anybody has any questions, they can communicate with me through social media. Thank you. Yeah, I think that will be a, a great way to take this forward. Thank you. Thank Over you to you, Deepa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karikin. Thank you, Dr. Bajwa. Thank you, Devanjan. Um, for uh, this very uh, quick snapshot of a fireside chat. Uh, I think um, we have about 535 people who are uh, who have logged in to uh, and listened to you. So uh, that was really great. Uh, we, um, we will now move to the uh, to the flagship uh, session of today's uh, event. And uh, that is a keynote address uh, by uh, one of the well known leaders of our times, Ms. Benita Bali. Uh, Ms. Vinita Bali is a business leader with extensive experience in leading large companies both in India and overseas. She has worked with eminent multinationals like the Coca-Cola Company and Cadbury Schweppes in a variety of marketing, general management and chief executive roles. She moved from a full-time role as managing director and CEO of Britannia to pursue her wide-ranging interests in the corporate and development sectors. She is a non-executive director on the global boards of Cognizant Technology Solutions and Bungie Limited. She has among she was among 27 global leaders appointed to the UN in 2012. Maternal and child health as part of its Scaling Up Nutrition Initiative and her term in 2016. Ms. Bali has kindly consented to share her insights on the topic of women in leadership taking us, us through her journey of becoming a global business leader, the successes and the challenges she faced, and what it has meant for her as a professional and an individual. I'm sure her story would be hugely inspirational for the audience, especially emerging women leaders. So, um, Ms. Bali, over to you. Thank you. I think you need to Okay. I am assuming I am being heard and being seen. Yes, ma'am, clearly. Okay. Yes, yes. We're able All right. To hear you. So, thank you very much and thank you very much for this uh, <clears throat> opportunity. I came in towards the fag end of the earlier discussion and um, it was quite uh, riveting. I think the topic that you have chosen, which is really to do with, um, you know, gender equality, et cetera, is, is, is a very important one. And I think it also tells us something about the times that we are living in, that in the 21st century, when we believe we've got answers to most questions, we're still struggling with issues of equality across all humanity. So it's not just gender equality, it is also equality of you know, race, religion, socioeconomic group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you asked me to speak about my journey in leadership, uh, which I will, but I also want to say that, you know, when we talk about women in leadership, the first point I want to make is that, you know, certainly when I think about leadership, I don't think of men or women or, uh, you know, race or geography or anything like that. Because to me, leadership is agnostic. It is agnostic to gender. It is agnostic to geography. It is agnostic to socioeconomic, uh, uh, you know, the classification or any kind of classification. Because leadership is a set of behaviors. Leadership is not a position. It is not a title. It is not an entitlement, but it is behavior. And because it is behavior, you can actually identify leadership behaviors versus behaviors which don't exude qualities of leadership. And what do I mean by leadership behaviors? It's actually quite simple. We see it all around us. Just because I am called a CEO or a president or a prime minister doesn't make me a leader. It is what I do in that role that makes me the kind of leader that I am. I can be an empathetic leader. I can be a leader that inspires fear. I can be a leader that inspires confidence. 
This is as true of businesses as it is of the academic world, as it is of any other world. So I would like, I would certainly like you to think about what I'm saying, and that is that leadership has nothing to do either with your position in the hierarchy or with anything else. My argument to that is that if I start off as a management trainee or as an engineer trainee or as a computer code writer or whatever, I can still and I must still ex exude leadership behaviors, which is about taking ownership, which is about taking responsibility, which is about taking accountability, which is about not making an excuse, which is about being empathetic. And when I'm talking about empathy, I am talking not just about cognitive empathy, but I'm also talking about emotional empathy. Now, if I were to just take these qualities, you know, qualities of understanding and empathy, qualities of responsibility, accountability, ownership, and you juxtapose to, you know, you juxtapose them to any women. The fact is that all women are leaders in their families because it is primarily the women who are keeping, you know, their households and their families together through whatever hardship. But somehow, when we think of leadership, we think of large organizations, we think of people at the top of the organization. We, we in our own minds, have given leadership a hierarchy. We've given leadership an organization. And my invitation to you is to uh, think along with me at least for the next five or 10 minutes and think about leadership as not a position, as not a title, but as a responsibility, a sense of ownership, uh, as empathy, as understanding, as, you know, uh, bringing people together. So I just wanted to start off with how I have imbibed my experiences and how I have created this conviction based on my experience that leadership is really about behavior and you can exhibit qualities of leadership in your home, in your school, in your uh, community, in society, as well as in the organization in which you work. So, you know, talking about my own uh, leadership journey, many times I get asked the question that, uh, you know, what goals did you set for yourself? Uh, did you know that you were going to be part of the corporate world? And my answer to that is no, because I did not. Uh, in fact, if you had asked me when I was still in school and college, uh, my goal was initially to become a pilot, then it was to become uh, a neurosurgeon, then it was to join the, you know, the Indian Foreign Service because I like to travel. And, uh, you know, guess what? I landed up in an MBA. And um, what happens when, when you are there is you get a job before you've even got your degree. And, um, you know, that set me off on my corporate journey, which I must say was a very exciting journey uh, because I got opportunities and I took those opportunities. I think I operated in the corporate world with a sense of curiosity and with a sense of adventure. And I never once thought about myself as being a woman in a world which was dominated by men. And I can tell you that I was the first ever woman who was a manager who joined Cadbury India, and this is in 1980. So we're not talking about 100 years ago, we're talking about you know 1980 when I started working with Cadbury's. I was the first and only woman to go as sales and marketing director of Cadbury Nigeria. I was you know, the first woman who was on the board of Cadbury South Africa as well as Cadbury Nigeria when I moved to South Africa after finishing my stint with Cadbury's in Nigeria. Uh, I was the third ever woman in the history of the Coca-Cola company to be made a division president. Now, why am I sharing all this? Because, you know, people get very excited when they 
uh, you know, they listen to these uh, facts. But actually, that is missing the point. The point really is that you get opportunities based not just on your gender, but actually based on the work that you do, the contribution that you make, and the way in which you make that contribution. So it is not just the how, the, the what of uh, you know, your accomplishment, but also how you have gone about accomplishing what you have accomplished. So I don't get ruffled walking into a room full of 40 or 50 men where I'm the only woman because I have a conviction and a belief that I am there not because of the fact that I'm a woman, but because I have the right academic credentials, I have the right experience, I have the right track record, I have the right attitude, I have the right attributes to go in there and make a meaningful contribution to whatever the discussion is. And my invitation to all of you who are women in the audience is really to try this out for yourself. Walk into your place of work with the conviction that you are there because of the contribution you can make, because of the academic qualification you have, because of your experience and your track record. And don't think of yourself in gender terms or in any other terms. My invitation to all the men who are in the audience is to say that since there are many more men in positions that make decisions, and you know, every organization talks about diversity and inclusion. I have yet to see an organization that does not talk about diversity and inclusion. And yet when you look at the numbers, the numbers are pathetically low. The best of the best companies, not just in India, but around the world, have at best 25% women. And when you look at the senior management within those women, the number falls even further. You look at Fortune 500 companies, you know, there's less than 10% of those headed by women, uh, why 10%, less than 5% headed by women. Same as the story in India. In fact, the story in India is worse. So I think the question we have to ask ourselves is that when there are so many competent women, how come? We, as individuals, as society, as community, as people who are responsible in organizations, are not giving them the opportunities that get them to do their best work. And I think for that, we have to turn to anybody who is in a position of authority, who is in a position where you are making uh, decisions, and ask you to question those decisions. Are we operating with biases that are perhaps unconscious biases? In my case, again, I was fortunate enough. I personally never thought about it. And in the organizations in which I worked, whether it was Cadbury India, who first sent me overseas in 1983, when not many marketing people from India were going overseas to work, and I went to the UK, it was Cadbury again who sent me to Nigeria. It was Cadbury who asked me to go to Cadbury, South Africa, uh, when the nation was opening up and the transformation was happening. This is in 1993, 94. I then joined the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. I was sent to Latin America, which is as macho as macho gets, uh, responsible for uh, the duties of a division president for South Latin America etc cetera, etc cetera. and i came back to india as ceo of britannia and there weren't very many professional ceos uh, uh, you know in manufacturing companies and marketing companies at that time now i don't think that is the story i think the story is what opportunities i was given how i handled those opportunities and how there was a system around me and how I created a system around me that was that recognized contribution without thinking of gender. It was a system that recognized performance without thinking of gender. It was a system that inspired and encouraged without thinking of gender. And I think in whatever role we play, no matter where we are, I think if we can create those kinds of environments, only then we will begin to see the big difference 
that all of us want to see, are desirous of seeing in ourselves, in the lives of our daughters, in the lives of our sisters, in the lives of people who matter to us. And I think each one of us, therefore, has a role to play in making that happen. It is not the issue of women. It is not the challenge of women alone. This is a challenge for society. This is a challenge for our communities. This is a challenge for our country and the world. And unless all of us participate in solving that challenge, in giving not just women, but everybody, all human beings, and frankly, you know, the environment, which includes, you know, the trees and the flowers that we have been given an abundance of, unless we treat the planet and its people and its inhabitants with respect and love and compassion, we will not be able to see the change that we are desirous of seeing. So I think I have, uh, you know, taken my 15 minutes and I believe we have about five minutes for uh, questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bali, for really those uh, very, you know, inspiring uh, uh, words which you have shared and, you know, from your journey. Um, I, there are a couple of questions, uh, if I may. Um, so there is a question about from a person who says that um, uh, how did you, you know, with all these positions that you have held at, you know, and being like the trailblazer, if you like, uh, how did you handle the stress and emotion in your leadership journey in the workplace? <laughs> you know, this is another interesting question, uh, stress and emotion. Um, you know, frankly, I'm not a person who um, stresses out um, because I think I, uh, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't mean that I am, you know, very calm under every situation, but I don't think work, I have let work be a cause of stress. And I think that's another very important point. If you enjoy your work, then that enjoyment doesn't really create success. It creates challenges. And there have been plenty of challenges. But there is a big difference between challenge and success uh, and stress. I also think that positive uh, stress is a very good thing because positive, uh, positive stress gets you to give of your best. So I think stress becomes negative when we feel that the situation is out of control, when we feel that we can't change the situation, when we feel inadequate. I think that's what causes uh, stress. But a good challenge when, you know, take COVID. Did anybody know how to handle COVID um, irrespective of what organization you belong in? And yet you can see there are companies and individuals who've handled it really well and others who are struggling through it. The difference really is in how we approach things, in, in our own attitude to uh, what we do. So again, my, uh, my invitation to you would be, don't let situations stress you out negatively. Positive stress is good when it is a challenge. And you know, figure out, ways of relaxing yourself. If it is listening to music, going for a walk, uh, you know, going and playing a sport, working out in the gym, um, because those are very good avenues of distraction, which all of us need in demanding work situations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think there is a, a, one of the comments is that um, positive stress uh, is a new learning for me from one of the audience uh, has posted a comment. Um, there is another question uh, around, uh, you know, mentoring and coaching. Uh, so um, uh, you mentioned in your in your address that, uh, you know, the, the, the representation of women in, in different levels, especially in senior levels with an organization is is quite quite less. So do you think that, uh, you know, um, um, mentoring and coaching programs uh, and, you know, networking between women could be some a sort of a solution and are organizations doing enough to put these kind of measures in place? Um, no, organizations are not doing enough to put those measures in place because if they were, then the numbers would be very different. 
So I'm being very blunt when I say that. You know, mentoring and coaching is fine, but I think women talking to other women is not going to solve the problem. We have to get mentors and coaches and sponsors who are men in organizations. And here I'm talking about corporate, universities, any environment, you know, where you've got to take people who are in positions of authority and decision making because they are the ones who are making those decisions. And I think if that demand doesn't come internally, the external environment is going to place that demand, certainly on business organizations. They've already begun to do that. And we will see greater and greater demands in terms of in diversity, inclusion, uh, ESG, etc. So I think organizations who are organizations who are proactive need to very seriously think about this and say, how do we create equal opportunities? I'm not even saying more opportunities. I'm saying, how do we create equal opportunities for men and women in the organization so that the best individual, irrespective of that individual's uh, gender or sexuality or uh, religion or ethnic community or geography or anything else. Uh, you know, let that not interfere with what is required to be competent in the job that you are being recruited for and promoted for. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. There are a few other questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. And uh, so we will have to conclude it here. I want to take this opportunity to really thank you for giving us your time, even though it has been uh, you know, a short, but it has been a very powerful statement and you know, input that we have received. In fact, when you agreed to come on this on this summit, you know, it, we felt it was a little bit of we managed to pull off a coup, you know, that uh, we, we got you, we got a really one of our star speakers to come and speak at this event. So uh, it's been really amazing, and and thank you so much for you know your the sharing your journey and and, and you know the, from the comments. I think most of the people agree that, you know, they have been very inspired by your leadership journey. Thank you so much. And um, we will move on to the next session uh, sessions now. It's a, they, we are having two workshops. This is for the audience. Uh, we are having a workshop on, um, uh, you know, her safe space uh, about making the online and offline world safer for women and girls and community based strategies for the use of media. Uh, in women's empowerment. So each of these sessions, each of these workshop sessions, uh, they are actually case studies led by our British Council teams from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Uh, the uh, the safe spaces uh, um, safe spaces workshop is led by our uh, uh, Sri Lanka team, and it was it you know uh, we've got some experts who are speaking uh, speaking at this event, and uh, similarly the. Uh, community-based strategies uh, on the use of media for women's empowerment is led by our Bangladesh team. Uh, and they would like, you know, be giving you inputs on uh, how they, these strategies they have implemented in there. So uh, stay around and uh, join us for this, this workshop. They are more practical and, uh, you know, practice oriented. Thank you very much and hope to see you at the workshops. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Sharika Kure from the United Nations Population Fund and the National Program and Policy Analyst for Women's Rights and Gender. So um, I'm happy to be part of these sessions that uh, British Council is conducting to commemorate uh, the International Women's Day. Today we are going to discuss, as uh, the previous speaker said, some case studies, and this is a case study from Sri Lanka, adapted to the British Council's active citizens model to address the issue of sexual and gender-based violence within the communities. This model encourages uh, communities to take responsible on issues, social issues such as this. 
So before we start the discussion, I would like to provide a little bit of context to some of you. So we're all aware that sexual and gender-based violence is a grave human rights violation and a public health issue prevalent in every society and community. It highlights uh, deep ingrained gender inequalities in each of our societies and has serious implications, not only to the individual, the families, the communities, and the country as a, as a whole. So this has now transcended to the online space as well. And we are increasingly seeing the voice of women and girls silenced due to the harassment in many forms and which is increased due to the present pandemic. Uh, that we are experiencing. This is um, in Sri Lanka, the evidence indicates that five uh, ever partnered women have experienced physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Two in every five women have experienced physical, sexual, emotional, or economic or controlling behaviors by a partner in their lifetime. One in four women and girls have experienced physical or sexual violence since age 15 by a partner or a non-partner. But we must understand this is from the national uh, survey done by the Department of Census and Statistics in Sri Lanka. We must understand these statistics are just the tip of the iceberg and the issue is much greater. So I'm happy that projects such as this are taking place and I'm happy to introduce the project uh, partners, the project addressing violence against women and girls, a community empowerment journey supported by British Council in Sri Lanka. So it is conceived and co-created with four key civil society partners, uh, Foundation for Innovation and Social Development, FISD, and they are implementing partners, Jana Social Action Network, Janata Action, as well as Youth Network, Hashtag Generation. So to date, the project has run for 18 months in uh, three districts, which is Batiklo, Hamban, Jatna, and Monaragala, uh, to ensure women and girls have the skills, confidence, networks to contribute and benefit economically, socially, and politically, and being free from the fear of violence. Dialogues with service providers have been had, engaging men and boys uh, have been part of the project. So, before we invite our two panelists, I would uh, like to uh, now um, ask uh, to play a little video about the project. Thank you. 
Thank you. So, as you can see from the project is looking at redefining violence against women and girls as a community problem and engaging a wider group of stakeholders. So we have two of our partners here, Samita and Senel. So now I would like to introduce and welcome uh, Samita. She's the director of programs at FISD to uh, give us uh, an understanding Samita on to what strategies you will use to engage the local communities to address violence against women and girls? And what were the key learnings from this project? Over to you, Samita. Thank you, uh, Sharika. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And um, warm greetings from Sri Lanka. Um, so since um, we don't have much time, I will try to uh, uh, skip through the slides and just give a summary of what we have done. Uh, as Sharika also explained, the project Empowering Communities to Address Violence Against Women um, was a community empowerment program, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which happened uh, uh, throughout uh, the last uh, one and a half years to create a safe space uh, for women and girls. Uh, in selected communities. Um, so as um, uh, and since this is a kind of, you know, like um, uh, the project was like happening both online and offline, I will be more concentrating on what we did at the community level uh, with the people, engaging people at the community level. Uh, it's a kind of a journey that we took with the um, uh, women and uh, young people at the communities uh, that we selected to work with, depending on the, um, uh, the kind of, you know, the priorities that these communities had or the relevance or the prevalence of the uh, uh, gender-based violence in these particular communities as uh, informed to us by uh, different community stakeholders. 
So um, we actually did concentrate on uh, community consultation and we actually had the problem analysis workshops by with uh, women and young people coming from these communities because we actually uh, the, the the organizations who took part in this project were already working in these communities on different aspects the communities were already mobilized and we actually mo mobilized or actually work start working with the uh, women and youth leaders who are already doing something for their communities so that is how uh, the one and a half years or the 18 months uh, process and bringing effective results makes sense. Uh, so working with these women and young uh, people uh, to map up uh, the issues and the prioritizing uh, what interventions or what um, areas of work that needs to happen in these communities were a very interesting process. Uh, and, and the project, uh, you know, like just to mentioned that they had few stages where we had the uh, problem analysis, where we mapped the uh, requirements and we, where we kind of you know, engaged the young people and uh, women in uh, knowledge and capacity building programs, and then uh, kind of you know, engaged them in designing their own projects and implement the projects at the community level. So that was, uh, I think that was the uh, triggering point in this project where that engagement makes sense and that engagement actually makes an effective uh, environment for people to uh, create a, a kind of you know create a change in their communities so uh, in the journey the most important factor is that uh, people themselves uh, uh, kind of try to understand the problem in their own uh, through their own eyes because otherwise when we go and tell them the problem they always deny and say no we don't have that kind of problem in our society likewise you know when when it when violence becomes a private issue people always talk about uh, there is violence out there but not in my own house not in my own community so those we we also had the understanding that there is a denial from people's side so that is why we wanted people to analyze their own problem and see it from their own eyes and uh, kind of, you know, uh, design the interventions uh, depending on their own capacity and depending on their own abilities to engage in. Uh, so uh, because of that, the uh, results were also owned by the community, uh, women and young people. Uh, we, uh, as Sharika also said, we actually facilitated the whole process through partnership, and that also makes sense. That also ad ad added on to the effective results because we, the partners, were covering the geographical areas, and they already had the experience of empowering communities on different other aspects, which they also used in this project. And um, also, they had the, uh, uh, you know, uh, ability to uh, facilitate the stakeholder engagement. Uh, in this process. Uh, the, uh, the partners already had strong uh, partnership with British Council and had a history of uh, working with, on youth empowerment uh, in different districts. So those experiences were very useful uh, in uh, designing this project. And the partners also had the national visibility and recognition, which you know, helped the bottom up and the top down process and engagement of different stakeholders from the community level as well as from the divisional and the district levels and from the uh, government level to the uh, other uh, community level uh, stakeholders. And also the partners brought uh, the technical expertise uh, to uh, combine it with the active citizens methodology that we used uh, in this project uh, with the British Council's engagement. So I think uh, just to mention the British the methodology of the uh, whole process, uh, where we actually develop the capacities of uh, women and young people through active citizens methodology, cascading it to incorporate or integrate gender and GBV, uh, and uh, like take them through the journey of active citizen uh, youth leadership or the uh, community engagement process, where. Uh, women and young people developed or designed their own social action projects. So that being the uh, methodology uh, for this project, um, we actually, uh, I'm just moving into the lessons learned uh, because uh, the, the engagements were different and the engagements were quite um, kind of, you know, were styled by the young uh, people and the uh, women. Uh, but let me uh, move into the uh, lessons learned from the project. 
uh, where uh, we actually, uh, with the engagement of young people, designing their own social action projects to intervene, women actually, um, uh, women uh, were, were like, you know, we understood that in the project, women were more focusing on uh, individual household and community levels while young people are looking at more societal level. Uh, the combination of these group interventions by young people, young and women, has thus had more uh, effect uh, in uh, kind of you know generating results uh, because they were like you know expertise uh, bringing expertise at both ends uh, the structured and the long duration uh, training sessions uh, aimed at addressing violence against women gave more time for reflections and ability to gain insight into the nature of the problem and effective project designing we know that normally in a short term project, we don't give much uh, time to train people or to engage them in capacity development. But this, the specialty of this project is that this active citizens um, uh, social development program was five days long training. And of course it was very challenging when it comes to engaging uh, women and uh, young people because to engage them in a long term uh, training uh, program to give them enough time to reflect, give them enough time to uh, bring their own insights into the nature of the problem and, you know, effective project designing. Uh, we actually has to ca cascade the training to accommodate the challenges faced by women. Uh, and like, you know, giving them the transport, family, um, like uh, having the family discussion prior to the trainings, engaging uh, men in the families at the community level before the training, uh, and also kind of, you know, uh, uh, focusing on group traveling for women and young people uh, so that uh, their mobility is more accommodated and providing childcare support. All these had to happen uh, to accommodate the long-term training, which actually had a very uh, interesting effect on the project. So project de de uh, designing actually um, to tackle, uh, was done to tackle the strongest and the harmful gender norms uh, that was leading to uh, violence against women. Uh, this whole project, our work actually emphasizes how vital it is to listen to what women and young people themselves ha have to say about their lives and their options, their choices when it comes to, you know, creating the safe environment uh, for women from violence. Uh, this whole journey showed us that empowerment is not only about changing boundaries of action, but also shifting the horizons of possibilities because all the, they were trying all possibilities. Uh, looking at all different ends where, you know, like uh, when it comes to engagement, when it comes to reaching out to different uh, uh, categories of people uh, and like, you know, trying out so many different uh, approaches. This journey actually showed us that empowerment is not only about, uh, sorry, uh, this, uh, through this journey, women and young people actually develop the ability to create new situation for their own communities and create new conditions uh, and create new actions. And, all, and ultimately create their own story of success for their own communities. So those were the main points that I wanted to highlight uh, where, you know, if you get the engagement of young people and women to design their own interventions, uh, what magic it can do, you know, what effects it can bring to the whole uh, creation of safe uh, environment for women and girls. So I'll stop there for the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Samita. Indeed, it's very enriching and it is uh, uh, important that they own the communities themselves own the projects. Uh, so as we have very limited time, uh, I will now introduce our next panelist, that's Senel Wanyarachi. He's the co-founder and director of uh, Hashtag Generation. He has been part of the online um, component of the project. Uh, so Samita spoke of the offline uh, component. So Senel will uh, give us an understanding. Senel, if you can tell us what, how did you complement the work on the ground level? And also please uh, share with us uh, some of the key learnings. So over to you, Senel, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharika. Uh, and thank you also to the British Council uh, for this opportunity uh, as well. I will also share some slides and uh, I will also run through them uh, fairly quickly, uh, just to give you one a sense of uh, what the campaign looked like. And then also uh, what some of our learnings were uh, during the campaign, uh, what were some of the things that went well, and maybe what are some of the things that we could have done better uh, as well. 
Uh, so we are hoping that maybe uh, these ideas could also uh, inspire some of you uh, also in your own work. Um, and, um, and even though we're from different, uh, some of us are also from different contexts, I think there's also a lot uh, we can learn from each other as well. Um, so this campaign, uh, actually, as, um, as Sharika said, complemented the, the on-the-ground offline work that Samita spoke about. And the idea uh, was that uh, because we were working in several districts, one, to be able to share the stories from those districts, and two, look at also uh, at this issue from a more national uh, perspective as well. Uh, those were kind of the, the two main objectives of this campaign uh, that we called Her Safe Space. Um, so for us, uh, as the team that was working on uh, the communications campaign, um, working on an issue that's really important, but also quite sensitive, uh, it was a big responsibility uh, as well. And it was something that we took uh, quite uh, uh, seriously and considered uh, with a lot of care uh, as well. Um, so the idea and thinking behind the campaign uh, was that, of course, we can influence attitudes in the same way they were happening through the workshops and hopefully influence people's uh, behavior as well. Um, and the approach that we tried to take through this is to actually amplify the voices of the participants of the workshops themselves. Um, and, and I think this is uh, slightly different from some of the other approaches because sometimes what often happens is we also bring people who are either experts or intellectuals or academics or from civil society uh, to speak about these issues. And often sometimes the response to that kind of thing, especially online, is that, uh, is that we are trying to create an issue where it doesn't exist, like the NGOs and the universities and the academics are out there to kind of create problems in the villages, in the households, in the towns, when actually this doesn't exist, when violence against women is not an issue. Um, I think when we had, when we featured the women, the, the boys and girls, the, the division of secretariat officers from these uh, villages and towns themselves, talking about this issue as something that they were dealing with, uh, something that was happening within their families, in their neighborhoods, uh, in their communities. I think we were able to show that, that it, it was a real issue and that there, it's also something that's affecting people's lives, but also it's something that people are doing things about uh, in their community uh, as well. Um, another approach that we took was that the whole campaign was also trilingual. So what that meant was that it was done in single English and Tamil, and particularly in Sri Lanka language is, is a big uh, barrier to access as well. Uh, so even for kind of people affected by gender-based violence, I think access to service can also depend on your ability to speak in uh, Sinhala or Tamil uh, as well. So for us, for doing the campaign in the three languages also was very important. I understand this might be a little bit more difficult for in contexts uh, in other countries where there are maybe so many other languages, maybe then having sub, even though we had subtitles in three languages, maybe having subtitles in more than that would be quite tricky. Uh, but for us, this is also... Uh, something that was uh, quite important. Um, another thing also was that we would also be looking for the women and the girls uh, that were getting affected also just as kind of powerless uh, victims of GB, but that also they were also doing things in the communities to address them uh, as well. So it was not just kind of uh, women who were not kind of people with an agency that were only kind of dealing with this as an issue, but also they were doing things to actually uh, uh, solve this issue as well. And these were kind of some of the responses that we got. And of course, a lot of it is positive, but maybe the one that uh, some of you can't read is in single and is a negative one, uh, which is one that we picked as well. Uh, but uh, basically, it resonates with something like the, uh, the, 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 uh, the point I suggested earlier about kind of uh, NGOs trying to create an issue where it doesn't exist. But I think, um, I think um, that kind of comments which are negative are also important because especially online, often content gets shared among people that agree with us only. Uh, so I think the moment I see negative comments in, in posts and videos that we share, that means it's breaking the barrier and reaching people that don't agree with us, which in the online world is actually quite uh, important and difficult uh, as well. Uh, so, so often we treat negative comments as trophies that we like to have in our kind of Facebook pages and things like that. Um, so another thing that we did was also this booklet. Uh, which is also trilingual, where we documented the success stories and, and the learnings of uh, the project, which I think is also something we in uh, civil society don't do enough, documenting the work we do so that other people can then learn out of that and then replicate that. And maybe if we did something wrong, then not do that or repeat that mistake as well. Um, so that was also something that we did. Again, the approach was to kind of uh, share the photos and the voices of uh, these people themselves that were 
kind of our participants and people that were getting affected, uh, the men, the women, uh, as well as the youth. Um, I think one uh, one final thing that we also paid uh, a little bit of attention, actually, not really quite a bit of attention, also is to language itself, uh, because we know that language, especially when talking in Sinhala and Tamil, can also be tricky when we talk about gender-based violence. Uh, for instance, a singular word for rape is, uh, at least one of the singular words for rape is douchene, uh, which actually suggests something like being polluted. Uh, so then we also had to think about questions of how do we not use language that actually reproduce the same problems that we are talking about as well. Um, so that was also something we need to uh, as well. Um, yeah, those were just some of the learnings that I, I want to share uh, in, in this forum, but I'm happy to answer any other questions as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. I think uh, very important uh, learnings, uh, especially in terms of the documentation and the evidence creation, because this is, I think, like you said, we can replicate this project and also we don't, uh, we are very effective in using the resources that we have, the minimum resources that we have for addressing these kind of issues, because uh, we get very little, Samita, you would also agree, we get very little to address this issue. So um, we do have a few questions, but I think those will be addressed by British Council. So I would like to just give maybe two minutes to Samita and two minutes to Senel uh, to just tell us a little bit more of what your final learnings from uh, the, the final words from the project, and then we'll close the session as we have been given a very short time period. So Samita, first over to you, just your final words, and then to Senet, just for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Sharika. Um, just you know, uh, to bring some of the recommendations from the project and um, to mention some of the way forward uh, that we have taken, um, of course, as uh, Senel also correctly mentioned, and you reiterated that, uh, documenting uh, um, the good practices and uh, the positive results are very important. And we noticed that when we had the, as, as, at the final uh, phase of the project, when we had the uh, national consultations again with an, uh, a, a kind of a symposium to share our learnings, uh, these recommendations actually uh, came from uh, either the stake, either from the stakeholders or from the community, um, uh, women and uh, young people from the communities. So um, uh, documenting positive uh, results and good practices is very much needed. And also just to mention again, I mentioned that earlier, uh, the combination of, uh, when, when you are working at the community level, the combination of bringing women and young people together is very uh, effective. Uh, we have noticed that in all the social action projects that we have done, because women actually bring uh, the true nature of the problem because they are the true victims. And, and also, of course, I mean, I'm not saying that the youth are not the victims, but you know, women can visualize it more uh, because they have been living with the problem. And also they actually bring their own experiences, of course, both negative and positive uh, on uh, how to deal with it. So uh, like, you know, and, and combining it with young people uh, who brings the new thinking, the innovation, the, uh, you know, the ability to take bold steps and break bar barriers and use the technology, all these things actually blend together uh, to um, create a very positive result. Uh, and also kind of, you know, uh, to um, understand and identify uh, the, the strong uh, harmful gender norms that kind of, you know, exist in our sociocultural practices and in, in traditions in the communities is very important because we noticed that even at the end of the project, although we try to address some of the norms to the social action projects, some of the very strong harmful norms uh, still exist. So in the way forward, uh, working with the um, communities, we actually uh, uh, again map out these uh, uh, existing uh, harmful gender norms to take the um, project forward uh, in, in different uh, steps, you know, uh, and, and also to check the uh, factors that reinforce these negative uh, gender norms. And, and also like um, uh, to identify the gaps that kind of, uh, you know, uh, limit people to uh, access resources, access services. That is also something that we are looking at at the uh, next phase of the project. 
Uh, and finally, just to mention that uh, taking uh, the project uh, forward, we really need to address the current trends, uh, COVID-related uh, violence, uh, and also, you know, uh, in this uh, current context, uh, uh, to put more attention on the cyber violence and uh, the gaps in the communication, uh, uh, the way that we communicate violence. So those are the aspects that we will be looking at in the in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Samita. So I'll just uh, give it to Senel for just a minute or two to tell us about the way forward and also how the digital space is increasing and how we um, how we can reduce the gender stereotyping in the digital space as well. Over to you, Senel. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Shaika. Yes, as I um, earlier I spoke about how we were able to use the internet to kind of tell the story of this project. But as you rightly said, the internet is also a space where the kind of issues that we're talking about also happen where gender-based violence happens uh, as well. Uh, for instance, um, part of the work that, that I'm involved in also is monitoring for this type of violence. For instance, with Valentine's Day just last year, there were groups and pages that just propped up just to share kind of unconsensually intimate images of, of their kind of partners and so on. Uh, so it is also a place where this kind of violence happens, uh, but it's also a place where people are using positively on the other hand as well. Uh, it's a place where kind of women, girls, uh, queer people are using to kind of uh, kind of claim space, meet like-minded people, celebrate their differences and kind of engage in activism and so on as well. Uh, so it's a space just like in the offline world that people are using, of course, positively, but also as uh, violence is happening uh, as well. Um, I think the biggest, one of the bigger issues is, of course, access, uh, which is because uh, technology, the devices, data and so on are still quite expensive. Uh, so people need to kind of be able to access them, uh, as, yeah, access these spaces as well. Um, and, and finally, I think there are also gender-based barriers uh, for access uh, as well, where kind of uh, girls especially, but also uh, women are not allowed to be on, in these spaces, particularly by, by their kind of uh, older people in their families, by the men in their families and so on, uh, which, which is restricting their, their use, um, the use of these platforms. So I think all of these are uh, things that we need to think about, uh, but maybe things uh, that, that a lot needs to be spoken and done about uh, as well. But uh, thank you uh, for, for this opportunity. Thank you, Senel. Thank you, Samita. I think we just have just one minute to wrap up. So thank you to both of you. Uh, the next session is going to start. So I wish uh, you both and British Council all the best in the next phase of the project. And like Senel said, the online space is increasing. And that is, I think, the gap that was identified on how we ensure that we have mechanisms and systems to support so that women are not silenced. Because most of the time, uh, anyone can be anonymous on social media. And then uh, they can create a lot of harm. Because we feel that just because it's online, that women are not, uh, women don't feel this. But it's more abusive. They feel it physically and mentally as well. And they would change their location, they would change their numbers. And I mean, it is a basic right at the end of the day. So thank you for everyone who was listening to us uh, and from the beautiful, wonderful case study on Sri Lanka. So um, we will be signing off now and uh, we will give the floor to the next session. So have a good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for Sri Lanka and we are signing off. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, Sharika and uh, the team from Sri Lanka for sharing your experiences and the case study uh, from uh, from uh, Sri Lanka. I think uh, you made very valid point that you know the uh, the world of the internet is vast, and this whole idea of safeguarding needs to be taken very seriously. Especially now that we are more and more dependent on the dig on digital technology to remain connected with each other, as the pandemic has shown. <laughs> Uh, we will now move to the final session uh, for today, and uh, it is a it is an extremely relevant one to each one of us. This is a, that concerns our planet and sustainability. The issue of, ch of climate change is an important aspect of our discourse on gender equality. Women and girls living in poverty are particularly affected by the consequences of climate change and global warming. Although they are more often in charge of making their families. Uh, have access to fuel, water, and food, they tend to be underrepresented as climate decision makers. 
the upcoming session will explore the issue of underrepresentation and related inequalities the role that women have played and can play in leading response strategies to address climate change to lead the session i am pleased to introduce to you dr shahnaz karim director society art society and arts at british council bangladesh she is also the south asia lead for british council's global cop26 program a senior development professional with over 25 years experience of working in bangladesh and internationally shahnaz previously worked as chief of party for the charter centers advancing women's right of access to information project and as team leader for the world bank strengthening public expenditure management system she has held senior positions at the asian development bank transparency international institute of governance studies and brac she has taught at the university of dhaka and brac university and has worked as a consultant for a number of international organization including the world bank usaid dai and msi Shanaz holds a PhD in development studies from the University of London as well as a masters in international relations from the University of Dhaka. Uh under her expert moderation I'm sure that we will get some deep insights into the issue of women's leadership during uh in building climate resilience. But before I hand over the sessions to Shanaz of a, a reminder of a few housekeeping rules uh the session is for 40 minutes and will end at 5:20 India time. there will be a buzzer sounded at 5 minutes before the session is scheduled to end um there is a question and answer section which audience can use to uh, to input their questions to the panel and i would like to remind the audience again that the session is being recorded over to you shanas uh thanks very much deepa and uh, welcome to the special forum on women's leadership in building climate resilience Now um climate change is one of the greatest um global challenges of the 21st century and climate change impacts everyone but it impacts women and men very differently due to a number of reasons um you know there are existing inequalities and gender based roles and responsibilities and of course due to various socio economic and cultural factors so all around the world women are very disproportionately affected by climate change and in order to build a truly climate resilient society we must ensure women's participation and women's leadership in climate change adaptation mitigation and resilience but in order to do that we need to understand and acknowledge these differences before we can plan for adaptation and resilience from our eminent panel members today we will hear about both the downstream and the upstream issues in identifying and operationalizing solutions to these issues um it's a great pleasure to introduce our star studded panel from bangladesh we have dr tasneem siddiqui founding chair of refugee and migratory movements research unit in bangladesh and professor of political science at the university of dhaka from pakistan we have with us ms kashmala kalakhil climate finance specialist and member women in energy pakistan from sri lanka we have been joined by dr ananda mala balavatantri country representative country representative of iucn the international union of conservation of nature in sri lanka so my first question today um is to dr tasneem siddiqui and my question to you dr tasneem is if you would tell us about how climate change impacts women's lives and livelihoods especially in light of climate induced migration and we would also like to hear from you uh from your many years of experience in working in this area how to support and empower women to build climate resilient um societies um at the community level thank you thank you shanas it's uh, thank you for inviting me uh i'll start by saying that you know uh, any impact of any issue it's usually like you can look at it through gender lens you can look at it to through class lens ethnicity race religion all these lenses are important and gender is one lens uh, when it comes to climate change i think is very very pertinent 
So from there, if I start by saying that we know that 140 million people will be displaced due to climate change by 2050, if we say that, then automatically we know that half of it or more than half of it could be women. But any research that we have, we do internal migration when comes into the forefront when it is uh, uh, when you talk about climate change related migration and then you will see that in the you know uh, number of women the face of women when it comes to urban locations will be less it will be men more but then again if you try to probe into issue, you will see that there are sectors which are invisible and where women are dominating. So therefore, it is very important when you talk about uh, climate change and displacement or other form of migration, you look at it through a gender lens. So in the context of Bangladesh, if we come, what are the stresses? You know, we know flash flood, we know, you know, uh, uh, floods or cyclone, earthquake, all these things are problems of, that, you know, accompanies, gradually accompanies migration. So conceptually, if I want to talk about uh, gendered sort of uh, impact of climate change, the first thing we must say that uh, climate change is not directly always linked with displacement, but those who are in a, you know, socially and economically in a uh, in, uh, situation, not so much in par with the mainstream, they are the one who are affected more. So gender comes in from that particular lens where you will see that socioeconomic inequality make women a group more vulnerable to all these stresses that men are also facing due to climate change. That is why it is important that to understand gendered impact. So if you, uh, you know, if we just go into, recently we have done a research on climate related migration in Chattogram and then they came to Chattogram city. And when you look at Chattogram city, what do you find that men and women have migrated equally? They are, their numbers are quite high, but then again, domestic work and other areas where they're in, in employed, they're invisible. You can't see them. And then what happened that when it is, we ask them to take photos of what they want, what are their stresses in case of climate change and what actually they would like to do about it. So if I share their understanding, that will tell you that you do need a different type of policy intervention for women where, or for men in the same kind of socioeconomic situation. It again has to be dissected by gender. So women, what they took the pictures of, you know, uh, access to relief during disaster or carrying portable water, these were the major problem they would identify. And men would identify that during disaster, no, when you don't have uh, what is uh, access to loan will be their main thing they would highlight. But women would highlight water, women would highlight, uh, you know, food. And again, whenever it's a homestead, effect on homestead, women highlights, it's the homestead. And men highlights, it's the agricultural land, which is their livelihood. So these two, they would uh, differentiate. And why homestead? It is not only because of, it is the shelter on top of your roof, which is important to women. It is also, it is also equally important the vegetable patches and others you have beside the room, which, uh, you know, by the side of the room, which provides certain food and nutrition to the family. So whenever there is a disaster or any other event, climatic event, so these are the things women miss first. And now let us 
again, if you differentiate it according to uh, those who migrate from plain land and those who migrate from hill areas, again, you do see women are different. Women identifying in this case where they're living their insecurities, workplace insecurities, this thing more by main uh, sort of land uh, women. But then again, those who migrated from hill areas, they would say places for congregation, places for you know going together with other uh, people and then sharing their common ideas, even religious place. They would say that you know ethnic community they don't have access into urban locations. So again, you will see that lack of privacy while bathing, long queues for using toilet, sexual harassment, lack of childcare facilities of those who are working, who have come due to climate change into different locations. They will highlight those issues more, and men would highlight precarious work condition, lack of tenured job, uh, uh, fluctuating income, police harassment, these things will be highlighted by them. So the solution men need and solutions women need in a climate change situation is also different. Again, if you bring in the children, there as well you will see male children and female children will have different type of need during the time uh, or in normal time. So I, I, uh, I will just uh, concentrate from here on the second issue that have, you have asked. It is how to bring in women into decision making. See, the thing we have used, the photo elicitation, we have used photos male and, male and uh, female mi uh, migrants have taken. And then when we sat with the policymakers, and policymakers had completely different idea about climate change, what needs to be done. Their thing was waste management, their thing was road congestion and other things, too much migrant in urban locations. So when you mix these three, and when you give equal voice in doing anything that you are doing, then definitely all these voices will come in, even including children. So it is important that we the women are represented in decision making when climate issues are discussed and there is a policy now in bangladesh national strategy on climate induced internally displaced person in that that strategy is very much gender and that strategy everywhere the inclusiveness includes women in every step of the policy so I think when you develop policy and then you develop implementation strategy, resource allocation and everything has to be equal and certain affirmative action at the beginning has to be there to ensure their participation and gradually it will take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasnima. It's, um, you know, when you talk about um, how climate change impacts men and women differently, how it differs from location to location, urban to rural or hilly areas or, um, you know, plain land. It's, it's uh, you know, the plight of these people, it becomes so real. Um, and um, what you just talked about was that representation of women in decision-making is, is crucial to ident identify the right solutions because the impact is very different. I think that, uh, brings us very nicely to my next question to Kashmala, um, and that is on uh, women's involvement in and access to environmental management resources. So Kashmala, um, uh, two questions to you. One is on uh, representation of women in climate governance and also challenges women face in accessing climate finance. So these are the two questions to you, thanks. Um, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the British Council for inviting me to this very important discussion. Um, and thank you very much, Shinas, for your questions. Um, let me answer your question by, to help set a context, I will give you an example. Let me take you to Kathmandu, Nepal, where I believe um, the green public transport is not new. Women have been driving hundreds of electric um, three-wheeled 12-seater buses for, say, the last 25 years. But now what is happening is that these vehicles are rusting in garages. 
because the owners cannot find the money to buy more durable and also more costly costly batteries uh, that now need to be on the road that that are now needed to help uh, put these buses and continue to keep them on the road it's women like these running small businesses uh, at this scale who can actually become your face to tackle climate change but are not being given the enabling environment to do so now let's understand this clearly we all know that women are disproportionately impacted by climate change at the local level and we've all been discussing and understand and there's been researches etc there might be multiple reasons for this and uh, in order to answer your question i just want to focus on one aspect uh, of all these problems that we are facing overall when we talk about women and climate change we tend to lock ourselves in a discussion downstream on the problems that exist at the local level we don't try and look for solutions upstream and try and engage uh, at the table where actually money is being discussed and money is being allocated uh, so it's becoming very clear now that it's climate finance which is actually going to dictate uh, whether we are going to alleviate poverty and or gender equality or we are actually going to exacerbate both of these things it's becoming very clear now because that's up, up, the discussion needs to be taking place at that level and that's where the entire um, spectrum of decision making is happening all the way down now um, let me try and qualify uh, this statement with a couple of statistics before i move to um, four takeaways from my conversation in 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 answering your question uh, the statistics are um, a little dated about 5 or 6 years old but the 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 reality hasn't changed if you if you look at it even today if we compare the percentages will still be the same So um um a study that was carried out on bilateral trade by about 24 developing countries uh, about 5 years ago what we found out was that 29% of that assistance uh, targeted um a gender equality but when you actually look at the 29% what you what you actually saw was that only 3% was targeted was targeting gender equality as a principal objective whereas the 26 were looking at it as a 26% was looking at it as a secondary objective right from there it's very clear now you understand the money that you are you are allocating to the problem which is so huge uh, at the bottom of the pyramid is peanuts so you realize exactly where the problem is if you don't address the problem at that level it is clearly cascading into issues that we've been talking about and dr tasneem has very eloquently explained the issues that we're having with migration and other issues now um i would like to put in two more uh, statistics over here before we look at uh, the key messages from from what we need to be looking at from a financial perspective when it comes to women uh, and climate change finance for adaptation um has a much stronger focus on gender equality as opposed to the finance that is available for mitigation um of the total again i'm looking at the same statistics from about 4 or 5 years ago but the total climate finance related um, um aspect for adaptation was about 47 46% and uh, the target for uh, uh, mitigation was only 19% so within that you can clearly start seeing once you start putting these numbers on the table you immediately start seeing where the problem is and where actually the solution needs to be focused on um uh, when i say 46% to the adaptation side within that the real focus has been on agriculture and water side which makes perfect sense because that's where the problem is that's where you need to engage women this of course needs to increase etc but the problem then comes to the mitigation side where only 11% uh, um, uh women were involved or women gender was taken as a strand on issues related to energy and only about 12% uh, on issues related to transport so this clearly shows you the segregation of where the problem uh, where the even when we are talking about the limited um, resources that are being allocated to women and gender issues to solve at the local level we can immediately see within that where the focus is i'm not saying that focus is the wrong focus what i'm trying to say is that the focus needs to broaden um um with that sort of um, uh, uh, with that number and that example at the context i would like to offer four takeaways that we can then further build our discussion upon um again the first one is obvious where i say yes adaptation is very important that's where the negative impact is we actually now need to start thinking about how we involve women and get give them the opportunities to participate in the green economy greening of economies and primarily supporting 
uh, focus on development projects where women will have equal say and equal uh, decision making in renewable energy and clean technology solutions. This is through giving them skills. This is actually giving them the tools to be able to de um, uh, contribute to the economy and uh, uh, support uh, the the gender just uh, the the transition. Uh, uh, between uh, from a from a fossil fueled economy worldwide to an actually clean economy, which we are ultimately hopefully all trying to move towards. If you don't involve the women at this stage in the mitigation aspect of things, uh, it will be very difficult to catch up at a later stage. So within that, the money clearly shows us where our focus needs to be. So that's number one. Number two, um, something that we need to start advocating for more from an upstream level is that the money that uh, developing uh, the, the contributing partners currently contribute uh, to causes on ground is usually through the MDVs. Uh, the, the push, the advocacy needs to be is that this, we need to start moving, start advocating for money to be channeled not through the MDBs, but the actual multilateral climate funds that have now been set up through different um, streams through the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC first, and now of course the Paris Agreement. What happens when you do that is that these funds, the, the multilateral climate funds that have been developed, they have very stringent climate, uh, the, uh, they have very stringent gender policies. While not perfect, but at the same time, at least you are giving um, at least some voice and some say in ensuring that if this money does come through this channel, it will automatically be um, uh, liable, it will automatically have to fulfill the criteria of the gender policy that so many governments have uh, sat together to develop and ensure that uh, money is spent in the right way. So again, an upstream problem that we need to start looking at and trying to start offering solutions on is that work with contributing countries to move away, to move their money from MDBs, where generally they're not liable, they don't have it. the World Bank, for example, I, I don't believe they have a, a specific policy which is mandated on gender, where they're allowed to uh, develop the project, uh, projects as they are um, with not such a strong uh, component for um, uh, on gender just uh, on, on gender just support. And that clearly then reflects in the numbers that I just explained earlier. Uh, so very important to actually start advocating and pushing for money to be spent, to be channelized um, from the MDBs to the, um, the funds that have now been created for this particular purpose. Um, uh, the third um, supplementary issue, uh, the third supplementary takeaway on this one would be that um, when we generally talk about financing opportunities, what people will tell you is that, you know, regardless of the gender, um, anyone can get the finances if they require, if they fill the requirements. Now that's a big if, right? Uh, these requirements are actually easier to meet if one is experienced, they have their business, they have properties, and then they have a savvy social network, right? And then they have access to financial instruments. Uh, and institutions. So in theory, men and women have an equal playing field, but in reality, we know that it's very, it's much more harder for women to actually be able uh, to be in that position. So while what I said earlier in my second takeaway, we, we continue to um, negotiate and push countries to get money to come through uh, multilateral uh, support facilities, but at the same time, we push our, we advocate, we should advocate and push for our national as well as international governments to actually invest directly um, in grassroots women-led organizations, specifically targeting, targeting their capacity building, imparting technical skills, giving them specific tools uh, and techniques where they're able to actually start contributing to the economy from a mitigation point of view, um, in addition, of course, to the support that they need to build their resilience, et cetera. And then finally, um, uh, my last takeaway is interesting research is that we always see that uh, when women were not informed or involved at the beginning uh, of any climate change action, the result was always a negative impact on the sustainability of it. Uh, so the, the money that was actually put on a finance invest on a climate finance uh, the, uh, for, for a climate action project, ultimately because women were not involved, their, their, their voices were not heard in the process, they, the, the sustainability only lasted till the project lasted. It didn't have a life of uh, its beyond. So, uh, which is why I feel and generally something that we advocate all the time that it's very important and it's critical that we normalize the need uh, for a monitoring system uh, that actually measures the impact of financed activities through a gender lens. This will actually give you a clear case 
uh, for uh, involving women um, in uh, climate related interventions for both adaptation and mitigation. So you actually have um, a baseline, you actually have some sense, some lessons, uh, which help you understand that when you actually involve women, the impact is much more positive and it, it's, it's no rocket science. It's something that you should be doing from the get go. But of course, once you have data, once you have research, once you actually have a baseline in front of you, especially from a sustainability angle, you immediately start looking at the finances from a, uh, from a different lens then, and you start involving women um, in, in the entire design process, uh, uh, of course, in addition to the execution and the actual monitoring um, of such interventions on ground. I will stop here and uh, happy to take further questions and uh, a discussion. Thank you very much, and as over to you. Thank you very much, Kashwala. Um, some excellent takeaways there and very practical solutions, especially on the, um, the last point that you made on, the, uh, on monitoring climate finance activities through a gender lens. This um, again highlights the importance of gender desegregated data without which we cannot really um, design or uh, put in practice uh, gender focused interventions. Thanks again. So um, the last uh, panelist of the day is Dr. Um, Anand, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce his uh, last name again. I'm sorry I messed it up the, the first time. Um, so Dr. Anand, um, thank you for coming. And um, my question to you, uh, again, two questions. One is if you would talk about a little about um, the impact of climate change on women, on, uh, on women's role in building up community resilience. And um, the second question is, how can we design and implement gender sensitive climate policies to deliver more sustainable and equitable change? Thank you. Dr. Anand, you're on mute. Thank you, Shainas. I think uh, uh, Tasneem and Kashmala pretty much uh, help uh, my two uh, thoughts. And uh, I did have a presentation. I don't know whether I can share the screen. Uh, you can, you can uh, share your screen if you want to. There's a share screen button at, at the bottom. In the uh, should Somewhere down the road, I'm having really big difficulty. Okay, I got it. Hopefully, you should uh, get it now. Yes, I think we can all see it. Right, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for inviting us too. And uh, let me uh, start saying a couple of things about the global picture. If you see, the general trend is that uh, most of the disasters and most of the climate impacts are water related. That brings to the uh, angle that the, most of the women related activities are also in a way water related. So it's a, it could be drought, it could be floods, it could be landslides. And uh, our thinking in uh, getting them involved in planning as Kashmala said, and also into the policy is probably a start around water is one thing and Kashmala rightly said the energy is the other one in the development. So those two areas pretty much need the gender angle into the focus. And, uh, all right, so uh, I'm, uh, let me uh, have some statistics there on a study funded by UNICEF uh, recently in Sri Lanka, you see, and we were involved. Uh, this considered droughts, floods, and landslides. And these are the observations uh, came uh, through a number of uh, areas from Sri Lanka aggregated. When you are faced with climate-related uh, disaster, the loss of appetite for food is high in women, and the health deterioration is higher. These are not, I would call it, some are significant, some are not that significant, but the trend is then the fear of further disasters. You are impacted, but 
uh, it might re recur or it, you might get hit again. So it's a high in the minds of female. And the physical environment, I think it was highlighted by Tasni in the, the safety aspect. So it was very widely expressed uh, in this. And the temporary migrations, so going and living with relatives, friends, is very high among women. And the housework, the load significantly goes up when you are impacted with the climate-related uh, activity. So this uh, actually brings us into a whole uh, different dialogue. I think Tasnim uh, said the lens. I think this provides us a bundle of lenses to look at uh, uh, interventions and uh, forward thinking. And on the same time, I think one of the questions is like how you motivate and how you work in the so one, uh, another angle, I think I there's another couple of data coming from that study. This more school children oriented. You can see the school attendance got reduced in uh, kids, uh, female kids more than men, obviously for safety reasons. And, and then the, the part alarming to was to us is the loss of interest in education. Because I think that tells a lot, because if you, going that path, uh, that's probably, it's not what we want to see. And the loss of school books, the notes and the bags, and so that's again high in female population. So there might be a lot of reasons. But uh, when it comes to engaging uh, youth and girls and in the uh, in climate sense, uh, we work a lot on the nature uh, angle in the societies. And one thing we realize is that uh, the need to uh, improve the understanding of the climate impact and the, the soil water climate processes behind the climate. Because it's a, if you know, then you are empowered to say something and get involved in design. So part of the problem we see in the communities and also at the high level is the lack of knowledge also preclude you from uh, being a good designer or a good planner. And then uh, this, Science, science sometimes overwhelming. The climate science is overwhelming. How do you take it down to the simplified level and empower people? I think it provides us a lot of opportunities to bring this uh, nature-based thinking towards uh, resilience. This is one example I wanted to throw from Sri Lanka. Now Sri Lanka has this cone shape. The center is high. That's where we have the cloud forest, where the rain is captured the cloud capturing and the slow infiltration and then go into the rivers and streams and at the end uh, ending up with the, in the ocean. Now, the droughts, the floods, the landslides, the sea level rise, all those things are part and parcel of this problem. So if you don't manage uh, <clears throat> the wind slopes, the land degradation and all that, so it again comes back to the part uh, mitigation and adaptation together. So <clears throat> the question comes, how do you take this kind of knowledge to the policy level and to the grassroots level and get people to explain, okay, to, in order to do the cloud capturing, you need to have the trees. So if you do the deforestation and uh, cut down trees, and then if you do the land degradation, you will have more silt in the reservoirs and tanks than water. So your hydropower and your power, the agriculture water and all those are affected. Then the whole mud, uh, the silt goes to the ocean that impacts the food cycle of the fish that carries a lot of chemicals also. So this kind of uh, uh, knowledge in a simplified manner and also at the same time, uh, we have advantage of uh, female being a good conduit to the knowledge, to the family. So taking advantage and providing that knowledge, I think part of the things, I think part of the answer, uh, you, the question you posed and the other part is, uh, how do you bring this uh, change in uh, climate? But uh, our experience among other things, uh, I, I think most, my, most of my work and my presentation is related to the nature, but uh, we can extend it very easily. You take the nature, it provides a lot of services and the regulating services that uh, we need uh, for our survival. 
and also the cultural services and the supporting services. Now, how do you get the gender focus into that? I think uh, Kashmala tied a touch upon this uh, on uh, the multilateral money. Recently, we worked on a Green Climate Fund project. The way we convinced Green Climate Fund was uh, saying that these, all these are going to get affected by climate change. And as a result, the poor people are going to be more poor and they are going to be uh, subsistence farmers <clears throat> will be more inclined to destroy the nature. And then as a result, it's going to have a spiraling effect. So these kind of uh, simplified things uh, uh, that uh, use, em use and empower the, I mean, everybody in society, but in particular, the women in decision making and pushing the women to decision making with these kind of tools can be really helpful. One example at the community level, we experienced this uh, work we did with ILO recently on uh, flood affected areas. We immediately realized that uh, there are a lot of products in that area that lack technology and knowledge. So the simple uh, syrup making uh, with we need uh, they need temperature and preservation technique packaging material so all this uh, knowledge help them to uh, build enough cash so that they can use that in the flooding times and things like that then the planning and then uh, innovative ideas uh, on uh, doing many things uh, that suits that particular climate and the ecosystem and then uh, put uh, people's uh, resilience on the high. So in community level, pretty much uh, is the knowledge and the planning capacity and planning capacity enabling them to uh, do more savings and also home gardening. That really, uh, there are a lot of home gardens that really help uh, people to access food during the disaster time, climate induced disaster time. So, so the nutrition levels didn't go down. So these are some of the examples, but all these things need uh, science, the knowledge, technologies. Uh, sometimes the cutting edge technologies uh, needed to be transferred uh, with uh, good packaging and preservation techniques so that they can even reach international markets. And these people did reach international markets. Uh, now they are doing a lot of uh, eBay selling. Now coming to the policy level, I think uh, there are, we don't see much uh, female in the policy level. I think that's one of the things that are missing badly. Now, this is one example we are really proud uh, with Shiromani Jahad and I was a climate scientist in the Department of Meteorology who is uh, telling us how the trends, how the things change in the country during the past and how the things will be into the future. But now I think we saw uh, uh, from uh, Madam Winter Bali to uh, the two colleagues spoke just before me and our moderator. Now, how do you take uh, your experiences and uh, encourage the youth to adopt the same paths and uh, take, I mean, at least uh, what I'm trying to do is to missing out the role models uh, to follow and to take uh, basically handholding. I think uh, that's something that we are trying to encourage, but uh, it had been a difficult task uh, with the busy schedules. We, we know some people, but we need to somehow get uh, them to uh, depart, I mean, impart some of that knowledge. So I think uh, probably uh, I may not have answered all of the questions she asked, but uh, probably I think this might be a, a good entry point for our discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ananda. Um, you're right that um, climate, climate science is quite overwhelming uh, for the layman. I was looking at your slide on the, um, the ecosystems and I'm like, wow, uh, you know, four or five different things that I never, never knew about. So, um, you know, and when you say that uh, building climate resilience at local level, um, there is a need for knowledge and a need for technology. Those are things we kind of tend to overlook because, you know, when you think of home gardening, homestead gardening, oh, you know, there's no rocket science, but you know, the use of modern technology and knowledge can yield uh, better crops. So um, definitely we do need to address that um, in building up um, climate resilience at local levels. Um, 
for uh, at the policy level again um, of course um, you know there's not enough representation of women and there is a, a need to build up um, more leadership to address um, women's needs and women's concerns so um, thanks very much we've had a number of um, questions from the chat I will um, read them out um, so one question was what are the direct negative impacts on women um, of climate change. The second question is, any gender differentials by health issues due to climate change? Any data on how many women know about renewable energy? An importance of public health lens in addressing climate justice to help displaced people. Um, I will start with the last, we don't have a lot of time, but I think we can take um, five minutes, um, Deepa, if we can. Um, so if I can um, uh, direct this question, importance of public health lens to um, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, the importance of public health lens in addressing climate justice to help displaced people. And I think we can all, I mean, I'll have to be very stringent with time. If we can just each take one minute to answer the question. Thanks, Dr. Siddiqui. Sorry, I don't work on health, so I wouldn't be knowing much about this. But from a layman perspective, I can say there are access to healthcare services. And uh, whenever it's, uh, you know, women, even in the origin area or as also in the, you know, in the destination area, in the context of migration, then you will see that they usually do not access healthcare services. And then mental health, if you bring in along with, uh, you know, uh, physical health, you will see that disaster and other things, the type of trauma, psychological uh, stress that it brings in, those things are hardly treated. And that is also in case of children I have seen, like girl child, when you see that, uh, you know, a family is in two places, one in the origin, one in the urban areas and the loss and certain protection and other things, then they have two types of, uh, you know, manifestation. Girl child try to solve those through taking herself more into inside the house and uh, not treating the thing. But boy child, we have seen, they go out, play, do things and try to manage their mental health. So these, I would say there as well, a gen, uh, uh, you know, lens that is required. And I just in one line, I will say about the negative impact. The most negative impact from the perspective of migration is trapped population. Women are in many cases trapped into areas which is physically unlivable. I think that is one thing we, have to bring out more into our discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think that's a very important point that you raised about the mental health, because we often don't think about mental health. Of uh, We think about the physical discomforts and you know, physical illnesses, but that mental health, especially for displaced population, that's a huge toll it takes on them. And that is something that also we need to address. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. Um, if I can, um, any, is there any data available on how many women know about uh, renewable energy? Dr. Ananda, would you be able to answer this one? Well, I can try, but I think, uh, I don't think uh, this is a knowledge thing. If, uh, at the household level, yes. But when it comes to the policy level, I think it's uh, very uh, limited now, for example, now, Sri Lanka has a lot of potential for wind. If you have the wind, you can convert that into hydrogen and make it a hydrogen economy. But the person at the household level probably will not, do not know the, the whole story of the technical potential as well as how that kind of policy decision by a country, how that will change the whole uh, life spectrum of uh, the things. Uh, so I think that way, there's a lot of knowledge gaps. Uh, if I may, I can add uh, to the earlier question. In climate, one of the areas that we don't know much is the temperature rise. 
because the temperature rise uh, is tied up to the vectors and the the diseases and different organisms grow at different speeds certain organisms uh, we don't will not survive at certain temperature so there are a lot of uh, unknown areas and important areas that also true for the crops and uh, the other things uh, other li living uh, organisms so it's a very important area for us to uh, work on thank you Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ananda. If I can direct my last question to Kashmala. Um, the question was, what are the direct negative impact on women of climate change? And I would like to turn that around a little and say, ask you, if um, women fail to access climate finance, um, what will be the long-term impact on, um, uh, on women uh, in mitigating or, um, you know, uh, uh, or adaptation, mitigation, resilience um, on climate change? Um, thank you, Shainaz. Before I answer this question, I would just take, I mean, I'm respecting the paucity of time, but I just wanted to give some percentages on the question before that. Overall, in the energy sector, you have about 22% uh, females uh, contributing to that sector. Uh, which compared to the renewable energy sector, it's about 32%. So you can, it, it's, it's just a good way of looking at how women are actually looking at the renewable energy sphere as an area that they can contribute to, which generally the energy sector has been seen as a male dominated um, sector by and large. Uh, coming to your question, uh, you, so basically what we need to understand is uh, if you take longer in including women, uh, you will ultimately have to. Ultimately, you will realize that the, 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 so one of the solutions to combating climate change or including not just women in the resilience space, but actually in the mitigation and the contribution to the overall economy space um, is through support from women. If you don't do it now, you will just waste time. So you are just increasing the amount of time that you get to it. But ultimately, uh, sooner or later, everyone will have to realize and come to that conclusion. Just in the process, you would have wasted a lot of time, which you could have actually done uh, much more uh, consciously if you, if you start involving them uh, now, as opposed to, say, a decade or two later. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kashala, Dr. Uh, Tasneem, and Dr. Ananda. And with that, we come to the end of uh, this session and end of the first day of this regional networking event on leadership for gender equality. Um, Deepa, shall I go straight on to the summing up or um, do you want to um, take a minute here? Oh, that's fine, Shanas. Please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'll just, um, so today we've had a number of sessions and what has been really um, brought home is that the value of um, inclusive and resilient socioeconomic structures that has been brought home by the pandemic. Uh, it's true that we've come a long way um, in bridging the gender gap in South Asia um, and the shift, um, the trend is in the right direction, but we still have a very long way to go. And it is women's leadership that will accelerate this journey towards gender equality. Um, in the session, in, we started today's event with a leadership forum, um, insight into the experiences and ideas of South Asia's most influential leaders. And um, so we heard how um, the position of leadership is used to bring, it should be used to bring positive change rather than perpetuating power dynamics patterns. But unfortunately, even when um, uh, there are women um, at women leaders, they sort of tend to perpetuate those uh, power dynamics. And um, we've heard how transformation of society can begin with one individual. We've heard um, uh, based on what we have been able to do so far in terms of education and, and empowerment and support innovation, um, we have heard that the way forward for us is to focus on gender sensitive leaders. It can be a man, it can be a woman, but they must support equal opportunities and accord due respect. Tackling um, climate change by educating and investing in, um, young, in the young generation is um, of paramount importance as we move forward. This is a very different generation of 
digitally connected young people. They're very tech savvy, uh, regardless of whether they're living in, um, you know, Mumbai or, you know, um, in a remote village in, in Bangladesh. So that is something we need to take advantage of. And um, we've also heard that we need to document uh, stories of innovative leadership um, and put um, and share those as a shared resource to analyze and strategize and design ways forward. And we owe it to ourselves, we women, to go and get what we want and what we need. Um, the session two uh, of today was on the pandemic's differential impact on gender equality. Um, we saw how it has led to, the pandemic has led to, on one hand, on an increase in workload and um, at the same time uh, to a loss of livelihood. We also heard from the transgender community about how the pandemic has impacted them. Um, the third session was a spotlight keynote on women in leadership. Uh, we heard from Vinita Bali um, who, talked, who said that uh, leadership is a set of behavior, not a position and certainly not an entitlement, which um, you know, leaders tend to forget once they are in these leadership positions. So um, Ms. Vinita said that leadership is about taking ownership. It's about taking responsibility. It's about being accountable and having emotional empathy and ownership. So these are very strong lessons that have come out of today's, um, uh, today's uh, session. And um, she also, and you know, it, during today we've realized that we have given leadership a sort of like a hierarchy. We've made it, we've given it an organizational structure, whereas it's, it's a set of behaviors. We need to come out of that mindset and view leadership very differently. Um, the next session, we had two parallel sessions. One was on safe space, both online and offline. It was led by Sri Lanka. And then we had another um, session on community-based strategies for use of media in women's empowerment. This was led by Bangladesh. And the last session of the day was the most special session um, on women's leadership in building climate resilience. But tomorrow, um, and I would like to thank um, all the panelists um, who took part in today's sessions from the morning. Um, and for tomorrow, I would just like to remind you all that we have another session. It starts at uh, 2 p.m. Indian Standard Time and Sri Lanka time at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Pakistan time, 2.30 p.m. Bangladesh time. We have um, sessions on how representation matters in all aspects of life. We have a session on women in STEM we have a very, um, uh, you know, I would say it, it's going to be a very emotional session on the shadow pan pandemic, understanding gender-based violence in the post-COVID world. And we will wrap up tomorrow's session. We will wrap up this two-day event with a valedictory session. And we are calling it towards a new decade of reaffirmed equity. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of day one. And we hope to see um, a lot of you, if not all of you, at the session tomorrow. Thank you very much. Over to you, Deepa. Thank you. Nothing further for, for me to add. Um, thank you to all the panelists for uh, you know, this really amazing afternoon that we've had, uh, three, three and a half hours of uh, at least I was uh, wrapped attention and uh, listening to everybody and, and, and absorbing so many things. And I'm sure, you know, the audience also has really uh, um, learned and um, taken, taken a lot of, uh, you know, taking away a lot of, uh, you know, information, awareness uh, about all the, all the uh, you know, different, uh, different sessions that we had today. So um, just a final thank you and uh, have a great evening, everybody. And, you know, whatever time of day you have, joined in across the world and don't forget to tune in for for day two tomorrow see you tomorrow uh just bye like bye. to mention one more thing deepa that uh this session uh these sessions have been recorded so if anyone has missed any parts of it due to a bad connection uh they can listen to it later thanks Shinas. bye everyone <laughs>